Uh, welcome back to yet another Rust live stream. Uh, oh man, that's a great name for the channel. Yet another Rust live stream. Um, we are going to continue with porting Java's concurrent hash map to Rust. Uh, we started this a while back. Um, and it, it was really just under the observation that we haven't really done anything that deals with low level concurrency and like unsafe code. And so I wanted to do something like that. Uh, and in this case, um, if you haven't seen it before, uh, we're porting Java's concurrent hash map, which is a, a, a data structure that the Java standard library provides that provides a map, uh, a hash map sort of like Rust's, uh, but where you can do reads and writes concurrently without having to stick any locks around it. And at least in theory, it performs well as you scale up the number of reader, readers and writers. Um, and so it's just, I don't want to say it's a straightforward port, but the, the entire code is written and pretty well documented in Java. Uh, and so we're just porting that code straight over to Rust. Um, and we had um, like a six hour stream on that a few weeks ago, and this is going to be part two. Now in part one, if you remember, we did most of like the, the read and write operations. Um, and we got sort of halfway through table resizing, which is a part of the insert code. Um, and so that is, we're going to, finish that up today. And then we're going to move on to one of the big differences between Java and Rust code when it comes to concurrency, which is that in Java, you have the garbage collector. Um, so if you're accumulating garbage in a concurrent setting, you can really just sort of um, let it go out of scope because the and not have to think about it anymore. And the garbage collector will, will ensure that whenever it's safe to free and drop the relevant um, memory, it will do so safely. In Rust, we don't have that guarantee. We need to make sure that we know when it's safe to drop a given element. Basically, we need to think of it as we have a bunch of pointers, like raw pointers all over the place. And at some point, we need to determine that this pointer is no longer being accessed by anyone else, and it is now safe for us to free it. But we need to do all that tracking. Rust will not do it for us. Uh, and so that is the part that we're going to have to fill in today uh, once we finish the, the resizing stuff. Um, uh, fantastic. OK, um, I'm going to do a, a sort of brief recap of what we did last time just to refresh, uh, refresh you all on how the Java map works. Um, and what we've done so far in the porting and, and sort of decisions that we've made. Um, and then we'll dive into what we're doing next. Um, for those of you who are uh, sort of relatively new to the channel, this is, so this is me, John. Um, and I do a lot of these live Rust coding streams. Um, this is part two of an existing stream. So if you haven't watched part one, go back and watch that. Uh, and there are also a bunch of other live streams on different topics on the YouTube channel. Um, if you want to support my work, uh, I can't actually accept donations because international student visas are weird, but I do have an Amazon wish list. So if you want to support, um, that's something that's linked on my Twitter account. All right. Um, let's dive back to the code. Uh, so what we have here, just so you're familiar with the setup on the right hand side here is the Java code. And on the left hand side is the rust code. Um, and I'm going to jump back there eventually. Um, so the Java code has two primary sort of top level comments. This is just the, the code from the, um, the code from the Java standard library that's just sort of been pasted into a file here. It has a, an initial comment that explains what the API for the concurrent map is. Um, and then a little bit further down, once you get into the, the class itself, there's a description of how it works internally. Um, and I think it's useful to recap this just because we're going to be dealing a bunch with the invariance that this, um, this comment explains and that the code actually implements. So the way the, the Java code works, actually, let me try to paint this. That might actually help. Um, ignore that for now. Um, let me see how well I can paint this. So, um, let's do like a red, red is good. Um, so in the Java map, um, we're going to have a, ooh, that's so far from a straight line. I think there's a bend in my drawing tablet right here. Um, we're going to have a bunch of buckets. 
and each bucket. Oh, that's really annoying. Give me a second. Uh, let's try that. That's better. Um, so there's a bunch of buckets, and each bucket is really just going to be a pointer for us. And initially, all of them are going to point to nothing. Um, and the idea here, like with most hash maps, is that for any given key, what we're going to do is we're going to take the key, we're going to take it, uh, we're going to take its hash, and then we're going to do modulo the number of buckets, right? Uh, so this gives us a number into the bucket. Let's say it gives us like some key turns it to seven, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so seven is going to go into here. Um, and this is going to be a linked list of, of nodes. Um, and the, the reason this has to be a linked list is because we're doing this hash modulo. You could have multiple keys that end up hashing to the same bucket. Uh, and so you might end up with multiple items each with a different key. So for example, here, both uh, seven and uh, seven plus, uh, this is gonna be nine, so uh, 16 and 25. All of those keys are gonna hash to seven modulo eight. Um, and so all of these are gonna end up in this bucket. And so if you look up a key, look at its bucket, you're gonna wa linearly walk this linked list. This is just basic hash map setup. Um, where the Java business is concurrent is in the following ways. Uh, first of all, oh, why is this being difficult? First of all, um, there is this pointer. This initial pointer, when we want to do an insert, we're gonna do a we're first gonna read this pointer and see whether it points to nothing. If it does, we're gonna try to just compare and swap in the first node here. So this is gonna be an atomic compare and swap. And if that succeeds, then we're done, right? Then we didn't have to take any locks, we just did the insert. And then we're done, we can move on with the insert. Um, the second case is if there is already an element in there, or if the compare and swap fails, which also implies that there's now an element there, um, then the element, the first element in here, technically all of them, but especially the first, is going to have a little lock inside of it. Uh, and if we need to add something later in the list, we're going to first take this, which is sort of called the bin lock, um, and we're going to take that lock, and once we get that lock, add to the list. Um, now, you might recognize this is something that's called um, a hash map with per bin locking, um, which is sort of similar in that for every bin you have a lock, right? So this is a design that uh, C hash map, for example, uses, which is another Rust concurrent hash map. Um, the advantage of this design is that here, in the common case where buckets are going to be empty, which is generally what you like, you expect in a hash map for most of the buckets to be uh, of roughly length one, um, then you will not ever have to take any of these locks because all you have to do is this atomic swap. Um, yeah. Um, there's also the, the other thing that the Java hash map has implemented that is sort of a neat feature is, let me do that color, um, is that, um, for any hash map, it might have to be resized at some point, right? Imagine that you have some buckets that are getting really long. What you want to do is double the number of buckets, and then you want to move all the elements from existing buckets over to um, uh, over to the new map, uh, and then you can free the old map. Of course, where this gets tricky is um, if you have one thread that's reading from this map, and then one thread that's trying to start a new map, which is going to be uh, sort of logically twice as large, sort of twice as many things in here. Um, so now at this point you have two maps and you have some threads that are operating in this map and some threads that are operating in this map. Um, and so the way the Java code does this is if you're a reader, you're just going to walk from the, you're always going to access, um, you're going to access the old map um, unless you find a thing that redirects you to a new map. So um, the, the way a transfer is actually going to work is if, if some thread decides it's going to do a resize, it's going to allocate this new map, and then it's going to start um, replacing these lists with a sort of special forwarding node 
that points to the new map. Any thread that encounters this is just going to move over to this this guy and look or do any inserts and reads over here. Of course, there's a challenge here because moving all of these bins over to the new new table is going to take a bunch of time. And so if a thread notices that this kind of resize is in place uh, is happening, um, it's going to assist with the resize. So we're going to have a bunch of threads and all of these threads are going to be helping with this move. And then eventually when the move is finished, then we're going to make sure that readers start accessing the new map entirely. Um, and then we're going to mark this map as garbage, right? And once this map is garbage, at some point in the future, we're going to free this map. We can't do it immediately because it might still be threads that are in the process of doing reads. But the idea is that this sort of transfer of bins from the old map to the new map um, is going to happen um, by having multiple threads help out with that process. Um, and that's where we got to last time uh, was, was this business of writing this, um, this sort of helping to transfer business. Uh, and so that's where we're going to continue. Before we do, though, uh, for those of you who are watching live, um, do you have any questions about the sort of high level structure? I mean, I guess this is low level, but but the the sort of structure of the design and how the concurrency works before we dive back into the code, like anything you want me to explain in more detail. This is a very like quick and dirty explanation of what we what we did last time. So if if you if there are details that you feel are important and you're not quite grasping, now's the time to ask. So I'll give, you, I'll give you like um, a little bit of time just to, if there are things you want refreshers on. Because it's, it's important that we're all on the same page as to where we're gonna start and what the, what the sort of structure of the code is um, before we dive into like the low level code again. Because it's been a while since last time, right? At least for most of us. Um, All right. I don't immediately see any questions. So if you have any, uh, fire them away, and then we'll we'll jump back into this, and, and I'll try to explain more. Um, so the place we were was this uh, tr the put function. Uh, so put is uh, put does a uh, well, it does a put into the table. It inserts a given key value pair into the table. Um, and the code is pretty similar to, let me find here, put val. Um, this is basically a direct port of the, the Java version. Um, and you can see that if you sort of squint at it. Um, and you'll see that mostly what it does is it finds the bin, it first hashes the key. It finds the bin for that hash. Um, it gets a reference to that bin. Um, and this is where you see the the like linked list business, where if the bin is a null pointer, then we're going to just try to compare and swap in the first node in the bin. And if that succeeds, we're done. We can just return. Um, if there is already something there, though, then either there's a node at the head, in which case we might have to um, we might have to stick a new, like take the lock, which is what we're doing down here, uh, and then insert the the key value pair that we're inserting into that bin. But this is the tricky case, right? This is where um, what we find when we're trying to do a put, what we find in the bin where we're trying to do the put is a, so one of these forwarding nodes, which we've called moved. Um, it's equivalent to this clause in the Java code, where it says, if you are trying to do a put and you discover that the bin you're trying to put into has moved, uh, then what we want to happen is we want for the thread that's trying to do that insert to help with the transfer. Right? We want it to um, assist with the resize that's going on so that that resize is going to complete faster. And the reason why it will actually complete faster in our case is because um, we have these we have the set of bins and the bins are entirely separate. Right. For each bin, one thread can just like compare and swap out the entire list at once and then compare and swap it into the new map. At least that's mostly true. Um, we did went through some of the details of that in the previous stream. Uh, and so what we're missing is this uh, help transfer function. Um, and the way I think this is actually not going to be quite like that. I think this is going to be 
self dot help transfer uh, table and uh, if you remember from the drawing, a, a forwarding node has a, um, a pointer to the new map, the one that we're resizing into. And one of the reasons why it has to do that is because you could, in theory, have multiple resizes going on, right? Where one thread discovers that the current table is too small, so it does a resize. Um, and then another thread, and then starts doing inserts into the new table, why the resize is still happening, and then discovers they want to do another resize because that is already too full. So it allocates another table. And now there's a transfer happening from this table to that table, and there's a transfer happening from this table to that table. Um, and so in theory, we need to make sure that this still works out. Um, and so these forwarding nodes actually have, um, if you look at here, this is our uh, node and a bin entry is a pointer to a table. So this is, um, if we look here at the help transfer function down here somewhere. Um, uh, yeah. So this is going to be next table. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, so the pointer there is going to be a pointer to the next table. Now, um, one thing that's worth keeping in mind is the Java code actually has two things that track the current table and the next table. Um, there is a sort of um, a global pointer that's used for the entire map. Let me see if I can dig that up here. Um, so we have like a, this is our top level struct. It has a next table pointer, and then it also has the current table pointer. Um, but notice that the next table here and the pointer that is in a given node, in a, like a forwarding node, might actually be different. Um, I'm not entirely sure why the Java code has this, but I think the intention is because you can have multiple resizes. And the top level next table is going to be the, the target next table like the one we're ultimately going to resize into. And this next table is where this entry, the one we're currently looking at, has moved to, which might they might not be the same. For example, even if there aren't multiple resizes, imagine that um, one resize happened and completed. Then the old, the old map, uh, let me flip this for you, the old map right here um, has a bunch of, uh, like all the bins are just forwards to this table, which is the one that we resized into. So all of the things in this table are pointing to that table. Um, and so there might still be readers in this table, right? Like readers that are really slow or something might still be in this table. And they are just going to encounter these forwarding nodes that point them to this table. Now imagine that there's another resize that happens. So this table is going to get resized. So we allocate a third table over here. Now we're going to start replacing the, the pointers in this middle table to be forwards to that table. But there might still be readers in this original table, right? We might there it might have been there might have been readers that were so slow accessing that table that they are still stuck over here. We need them to sort of move to the middle table because they might have to do a read from there, or they might end up getting forwarded even further. But so that the these these pointers in the forwarding nodes are pointers to go look here instead, and that might not be the newest table. Uh, because there might be a subsequent resize in progress. Um, so this is going to be a uh, next table. Uh, so we're going to have to write this method. Uh, it's a good question whether we even can. I think we can. Um, yeah, we can call self here. Okay, so we need to write this. Uh, let's write that down here. So we're going to have a fn help transfer. It's going to take a ref self. It's going to take a table. It's going to take a table, which is going to be a... What this trans is probably going to take basically the same as transfer. Uh, 
like so. Uh, yes. Yes. So it's going to take uh, help transfer. The way to read the signature is that it's going to help transfer from this table to this table. And the guard here, if you remember from last time, the guard is something we are going to use in order to do garbage collection later. The idea is that the guards track, um, think of the guards as tracking sort of epics um, where we collect garbage in one epic once everyone has moved on past that epic. I'll, I'll go through this in a lot more detail once we start doing the garbage collection itself. Uh, all right, so what does help transfer do? Well, okay, so it does a, a bunch of null checks, which are not necessary for us, I think. Um, although we can totally do them. If is null or if next table is null. Uh, then we just return table. Okay, so this actually returns a shared table, although I'm not entirely sure why it does that. Uh, we don't need this instance of forwarding node because help transfer is only called if the node is a forwarding node in the first place. Um, Okay, and then we're gonna do rs is resize stamp. It's gonna be this, where that's gonna be a table dot length. Where is our table down here? So it's gonna be bins dot len. And now we want, what's this? While um, next table is equal to self next table dot load. Uh, it's gonna take a guard and an ordering. Um, so this is checking that the, we're gonna help transfer from this table to that table. But we're only gonna do that if this table is actually the target of the currently ongoing resize, which is what this is checking. Um, and uh, the table is equal to self table load. Uh, and this is a similar sort of correctness check of, uh, we're only gonna do it if the target table is the same as the, the current target of the resize and the old this table the table we're transferring from is the same as the current table as far as we are aware basically we're only going to do it if the resize we're asked to do is the current resize um and whatever this is and interesting It's like a, this then does sc is self size ctl load guard. Uh, all of these loads are um, are ordering uh, sequential consistent because the so this is one thing I, I dislike about Java is that these are actually all fields on self. Uh, in Java, this uh, Java uses this, but there's sort of an implicit this before basically anything that's not a local variable. So this is really this dot next table. This is this dot table. Um, this is this dot sciectl, and all of them are marked as volatile, um, which is roughly equivalent to doing a load with uh, sequential consistent. Um, yes, the plan is to rewrite the tests as well. Um, so if uh, SC is greater than or equal to zero, then we're going to break. Um, or if 
SC is equal to RS plus max resizers, or SC is equal to RS plus one, or transfer index uh, is less than or equal to zero. In any of those cases, we're going to break because that's what the Java code tells us to do. One thing that's weird about porting concurrent code like this is um, we're sort of blindly assuming that the code that's in the Java code is correct, uh, which is probably a reasonable assumption, but it means that in some cases we're going to write stuff that we might not necessarily understand, um, and we will only really dig into it. Um, uh, we will only really dig into it if uh, if something turns out not to work. Uh, or if there's a, a line that's hard to port and we have to really dig into what it means. Um, and this is going to be compare and set int. Okay, so we're going to do a self.sciCTL uh, compare and swap. So sciCTL, if you remember from last time, is this, uh, this control value that's used to track um, how many threads are currently working on the resize and what state the resize sort of is in. Um, and so this compare and swap is, is to um, add ourselves to the set of threads that are helping with the resize. Um, ordering const. If this is equal to SC, uh, then the compare and swap succeeded. And then we're going to help transfer from table to next table. And we're going to break. Uh, what else do they have here? This is going to return next table. Um, the one thing that's interesting here is for this next table. This next table is really a cons table, if you remember, right? Because it's the thing that's stored in the moved. And what we're going to do down here is uh, next table is equal to shared from next table. Uh, and if you remember from last time, shared is really just a thin wrapper around a um, a thin wrapper around a uh, shared raw pointer and it's unsafe to dereference it and the idea here is that you can only dereference it if you know that the target value is valid and so the question here is do we know that do we know that the next table is indeed a valid pointer that hasn't been freed yet the way that we know this is um, uh, let me see if I can illustrate this. Actually, let's um, leave that for when we add the unsafe annotations. We'll, we'll do that for now. Okay, uh, so this should be fine. Uh, that I think is roughly the definition of it. And we wrote uh, transfer last time. Let's see if there are any fix me's or to do's left from last time. Counter cell figure out num CPUs, tree bins, which we ignore, and reservation nodes, which we ignore. Uh, ordering can probably be relaxed. We're going to ignore that. Treeify, we're going to ignore that. OK. Let's do our cargo check. There's, n there's no way this compiles, but we're going to run it anyway. Uh, what's the point of the const keyword if things are immutable by default? Um, the const, do you mean for raw pointers in Rust? So the const keyword for, uh, for, for raw pointers, um, it's just that they needed a way to name the raw pointer type that is not a mutable pointer type. And so const was the natural, uh, I cannot find owned in lib. Let's see. What do you mean? Owned is right there. Oh, it's the import not working for some reason. Use of undeclared type or module crossbeam. Really? 
But it's right there. Oh, cross beam. Try that. Mm, now what? No build hasher in hash map. Uh, we want ordering. That's going to be need to be imported. Uh, where is build hasher? Um, let's go to build hasher. Oh, it's in standard hash. Hash build hasher. Um, three, two, four. Attempt to use a non-constant value in a constant. N. Oh, that's awkward. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What we're gonna do here is actually. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is allocate. Um, when we're allocating a new table, we want to allocate a bunch of contiguous memory. These are going to be our bins. Um, and this is trying to do that as an array, which won't actually work. Uh, this is going to have to be, um, I think we can do this with vec dot into boxed. Um, so down where we have table, this is really going to be a box of this because we want it on the heap. Um, and that should be okay, I believe. We could make it a vec2, it's just I don't want it to be resizable, is all. Uh, cannot find, that's a node. Super table. Cannot find n on line 59. Uh, that should be self. Uh, why it won't work? Why what won't work? Um, I don't use LSP because I don't like noise in my editor. I would rather have them in a separate terminal. Uh, er, 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 expected trait found derive macro. What? Oh, that's because I didn't import hash. That seems fine. Um, if absent, oh, that's right. We renamed this parameter from no replacement to if ab, it used to be called if absent and now it's called no replacement, uh, which now I need to parse Boolean logic, uh, if absent and no replacement, are they the same or are they opposites? No replacements means that you will only do it if absent. So yes, they are the same. So this should say no replacement. Um, what else do we got? 28 old value, this should say old val. 390 finish equals true. I think that should say finished. Finishing. Uh, 425, oops. 425. Uh, bin I. Table bin. 
Oh, I think we want, I see, this is just I, not bin I. Um, when, uh, when would you want to use the channel featuring rust? I'm guessing to jump across threads. I'm not sure I follow the question. Um, 500. All oh, right. We need KV. That's easy to fix. Uh, 504. This is hash. These are just trivial fixes. I just want to get to the tricky parts. Uh, 49. Wrong number of type arguments. Uh, that is true. There's no S parameter to table. Two nineteen. Wrong number. This is K and V. Uh, this is K and V, and that's K and V. Mm, Three sixteen. This t <laughs> this takes K and V, and that takes K and V. Great. That's yeah, more the meth the errors I wanted. All right. No method finish. Line seventy eight. Uh, why is that? All right. We need to use hasher. Yeah. This is like lower level cleanup that was just like be, because the previous stream we mostly just ported the code and didn't actually try to compile it um this is just tidying up a bunch of the uh, a bunch of the shortcuts we made there like mistyping variable names and stuff what we'll eventually get to is the compiler complaining about um the fact that uh, you'll remember this from the end of the previous stream that shared does not dereference into it in its inner type. Dereferencing a share is actually an unsafe operation. Um, and so that's what we're going to end up with once we get through some of these errors. Um, like here, for example, like find is not found for shared is an example of this. Um, isn't it safe to cast U64 to U size implicitly? I don't think the compiler will let you do that. Or it'll be a checked cast, I believe. Is it normal to have use in functions? Well, I don't know about normal. Um, usually, I do it if it, if there's a if there's a trait method that I only call in one place. I might do it. Um, it's up to you. Um, Twenty seven. I see, this is, yeah, this we're gonna have to figure out. This is definitely a fix me. Actually, this has to do with move too. So let's do that uh, before we continue. Um, so it's gonna be find. Uh, it's gonna be, yeah, so this is the class node. That's the find that we already implemented. And then there's a special case for, oh, this use is like, Java overrides, which is really annoying. So forwarding node, extends node, it overrides the implementation of find. Uh, and the, the idea here is that this is, uh, you're looking for a node in a list, in a linked list, in a, in a bucket that matches a given hash and key. Um, and if you walk the, if you walk the, um, the linked list and you encounter a forwarding node, then of course you should stop looking in the current bucket you're looking in. And instead you need to switch to the other table. Um, and so, oh, interesting. That's going to be a little bit annoying to figure out. Uh, because this obviously needs access to, 
actually, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, so we're, what we're going to do is let table is Will's next table. This assignment is, is um, sort of useless. Like it doesn't really do much. It's just renaming the variable because the we actually let's just do this is next table. Uh, this is next table. This is mute table. Uh, and here the here we're gonna do let's name it just like it did here. And this is just gonna be a loop because we might move to the next table and then discover that that table in that table the list we need has also moved. So it's a um, we need to uh, iterate through these. Um, like it might have, it might be, have to be a cascade, cascade. Um, uh, if interesting. So what is this? If this, if is, if the key is null, which we can ignore in rust because the key is a, is a reference. So we know it's not null. Um, if the table is null or if what's n here, I see, or, uh, table dot bins dot len, uh, this is the same as is empty or Right. Then return null. Uh, it's probably not what we want to do. But for now, that's fine. Um, and tab at is going to be the same as table dot bin I think. So you remember from um, from our table at the bottom here, we have this this sort of convenience method for given a hash. Uh, find me the, the corresponding bin. Um, and so this is going to be, why n minus 1? Why on earth is it n minus 1? That is interesting. Okay. So what this is actually doing is, uh, is it's looking up the last bin of the table. Uh, well, Ended with H. Why is it ended with H? What a bizarre lookup. Oh, this is just the inverse. N minus one is just the mask from here. What a super strange way to do this. Because um, if you see here, let's look for another tab at um, uh, find me a regular tab at. Yeah, all of these are just um, doing at and the H here is the hash of the key, and n minus one is all of the bits that are currently being used for the. Um, it's it's equivalent to doing a modulo of the the table length, the number of bins. If the number of bins is a power of two, um, I was just surprised that they do it in line like that. But that that is why. Uh, and so this is really the same as doing bin i. So let n uh, let bin i is table dot bin i of um, table dot bin i of hash 
uh, and then bin is going to be table dot bin bin i. And if bin is null, then return this. Um, and then there's another loop. And this loop is y. I wonder. I think the outer loop is for iterating over tables. Like if we encounter another um, another forwarding node in here that forwards us to yet another table. Uh, and the inner loop is just It's just walking the walking the bin. Okay, so this does. Um, e hash. I think this is just doing this business. So this is uh, if um bin dot hash is hash and bin dot key is key uh, then we can just return uh, that bin. So this is if the uh, I don't understand why this needs to be a loop. Oh no, it is iterating over. Okay, so why doesn't this just call this find? That makes very little sense to me. All right, that's fine. Um, so this is just gonna loop over the, the nodes in the bin. So if the current bin we're looking at, so that means this is going to be a mute. Um, if the current node we're looking at is um, matches the the entry we're looking for in the bin, uh, then we just then we're at the right bin and we can return. Um, if eh less than zero, this is their special marker. So um, I see. So this is really going to be match bin. That's what that means. Um, if bin entry is a node, then we're going to do and find hash key guard. Uh, if it is a moved uh, next table, then we need to decide what to do. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to say table is equal to next table. Um, and then we're going to continue outer. And I think that means this doesn't have to be a loop. Because the end dot find is what's going to do the actual loop here. Uh, that's going to be this. It does suggest that maybe this uh, maybe turn into a loop instead of recursing. I don't think that's going to matter. Um, yeah. So the idea here is if we if we encounter a forwarding node, uh, then we follow that forwarding node. We look up the bin in the table we were forwarded to. If we find that there's a list there, then we're just going to search in that list. Um, if we find another forwarding node, then we move to the, the next table we're forwarded to, and then we continue there. All right, let's see what that gives us. Um, which, which also means, actually, that this can now just be a continue. We don't need the label anymore. now that we remove the inner loop. 
Um, the mask, yeah, the mask is there for performance reasons. The reason there's a mask instead of a modulo, even though it probably doesn't matter that much, um, but it, that's why it's there. Uh, it's a good practice not to use brackets in every if statements. Uh, in Rust, you don't use brackets uh, for if statements. Um, uh, yep, great. Um, no method find found for shared. Okay, so this is deref, right? Shared node has a find method. And so in order to call find on it, on a shared of node, we need to do the unsafe deref. So that is an error we want to be there. That's expected. Uh, mismatch type on 45. Um, oh. Why does that? And find. Mm. Expected nothing. Expected unit found shared. That seems false. Line 45. Well, n dot find. Should be this, which returns a node. So why is it saying that it's getting unit from this? Expected this. Right, what is it expecting? The entire match to be unit. Why is it expecting the entire match to be unit? This continue should continue for this loop. Oh, this needs to break. Great. Um, no method bin found for shared table. Okay, so this is a deref. Uh, this is a deref. This is a deref. Uh, no variant release. Five, three, four. It's because I misspelled it. Um, 498. Uh, expected eye size found U32. Uh, leading zeros. Interesting. Yeah, resize stamp is a really weird function. Resize stamp returns the stamp bits for resizing a table of size n. Must be negative when shifted left by resize stamp shift. I think this is going to be i size from that. Um, this is a deref. I size from. Um, it's a deref. Yeah, I size from u thirty two. It's not satisfied. Right, you're not guaranteed to be able to do that. So we're just going to do this as I size, and this as I size. So we want that to be signed, uh, store for shared. Well, that should, that should exist. So shared, um, oh, that's right. We, that only exists for atomic. It does not exist for shared. So on 488, uh, this is in, this is in put transfer. Uh, 
transfer. Where are you? Down here. So what this is actually do down towards the bottom. It sets table dot store. Hmm. Set tab at. These shouldn't be store, I don't think. These should be store bin. Because that's what we're trying to do down there. Uh, is shared equivalent to a shared pointer in C++? No, a shared is very different. Um, so a shared pointer in C++ is more like a, an arc in Rust. Shared is, something, is a very low level uh, type that the crossbeam library provides to us. Um, so um, a shared is a just a raw pointer with no guarantees associated with it, but it has the implication that it's um, it's uh, the, the target of a shared is accessible by many threads, and we don't quite know how many. Um, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more detail when you start dealing with the actual garbage collection and with this uh, the fact that shared dereferencing a shared is unsafe. Um, all right. Right, so this is deref. Deref, deref, uh, 479. Expected atomic found shared. Mm. Oh, I remember we looked at this code last time. Okay, so this business is. Um, uh, let me go back to the drawing for this, actually, to figure out how this code is going to work out. Um, all right, so here is, um, let me get back to my, let's do like a nice blue. Let's make it also bigger. For some reason, the buttons on my drawing pad have stopped working, which is really annoying because it means I can't easily uh, brush. Aha. Great. Oh, that's maybe overly aggressive. Great. So um, the observation here is, uh, so we have, a, we have our hash table, right? And in one of the bins, we have this business. Um, so imagine that we have some really long linked list. Um, and in the in the new map, let's do that. Uh, in the new map which is twice as long. Actually, let me just do that. So the new map is going to be twice as long, right? So if this is uh, n long, this is going to be 2n long. Uh, and remember that the way that we take a given hash and turn it into this is it's modulo n, right? Which means that in the, in the resize case, uh, h, in order to go to a bucket, it's going to be modulo. 2n. Uh, what this means is that uh, half, if you look at any given bucket, roughly half of the things that ended up in that bucket are going to end up in a different bucket when modulo 2n. Um, you can spend some time trying to convince yourself that that is the case, um, but it turns out to be true that um, this has like hash 1, this is hash 2, this is hash 3, uh, hash 4, hash five, um, some of these is going to be the case that mod n is equal to uh, h1 mod 2n. But for some of them, 
oops, modulo, that's an N, uh, is equal to, is not equal to um, the modulo 2N. The reason for this is modulo 2N means, let's take an example here. Um, let's do, uh, let's take a trivial example. 7 modulo 4, uh, modu modulo 4. 7 modulo 4 is 3. 7 modulo 8 is 7. But 3 modulo 4 is also 3. And 3 modulo 8 is still 3. Right? And it turns out that basically half of the things that hash to a given bucket is going to end up in the same bucket and half are going to end up in different buckets. Which means that we're going to end up with some of these that are going to end up in, let's say, bucket one, and some of these which are going to end up in bucket two. Uh, and it, it might be that this is actually split, right? So it could totally be that, uh, in fact, um, in fact, this guy over here, oh, come on. Uh, this guy over here also ends up in uh, bucket one. And what we would like to do is, because we're going to have to link them into their new places, right? This is B1, this is B2, this over here is N. Um, we would like to sort of amortize the cost of moving many things at once. Right here, we could just walk the entire list and move each element to its new bucket. So we do an insert for this in the new map, we do an insert for this in the new map, we do an insert for this in the new map. But that's sort of wasteful, right? In this case, these two elements could just, because they're both moving into here, we don't actually, like this link is going to remain valid because that link is going to be the same link in the new table because they both end up in the same bucket. And so we call, oh, the Java implementation calls this a run. Uh, and it also calls this a run. And what the system is going to do is going to look for a run. It's going to move that entire run into the appropriate bucket. And then for the rest of them, they're just going to do normal inserts. Um, and so that's that's sort of the, the idea behind the, the code that we're about to fix. Um, uh, where the, the the error we're getting, and so here you, you'll recognize what it does. Um, it it looks for, so uh, whether something is a run depends on the the bit, the next bit up from n, um, and so it looks for runs. This basically this turns out to give you the some run of n, some run of the bin um, that are going to all end up in the same bucket. Um, and if the run bit is zero, if the next bin next bit after n is zero, the those things that were in the run are going to end up in the low bin. So that is b1 in the drawing. Uh, or if the run bit is one, they're going to end up past n. So this is like seven. Um, then they're going to end up in the high bin. Uh, and this is moving the entire. This is moving everything before the run. Um, and here. For anything that we're moving, we're going to allocate new nodes. And that node needs to, the, the nodes that we insert need to be linked to the run that's going to follow them. Uh, that's perhaps poorly explained. Um, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to construct a linked list for each of the two bins, right? One for the low bin and one for the high bin. Remember how we're splitting the bin into two bins, right? Um, so we're constructing a linked list for the low bin and we're constructing a list for the high bin. But whichever run we ended up taking, we're going to have to append to the, the appropriate linked list. And we can append them as one chunk. That's sort of where we're saving the work. Um, that means that the next pointer here is going to be pointing to um, the thing that we want to append to the end. And that's going to be... Uh, that may or may not be existing nodes, right? It might be one of these shared nulls, but it might also be um, the run that we found. Um, and what Russ is complaining about is the fact that um, 
the next pointer should be an atomic and it found a shared. So why is that the case? Well, when we allocate a new node for the nodes we're adding to the new uh, linked list, the next pointer needs to be set to something. And we're setting the next pointer to whatever link was. The problem is that if linked was a run that already exists, we only have a shared pointer to it. We don't have an owned pointer to it. Uh, and this is expecting, well, it's expecting these to be atomic, uh, which is not necessarily owned. But you can think of shared as um, the target. You can think of atomic as a pointer and shared as the sort of the, the thing that's being pointed to. Um, so if you have an atomic, you can call load, and then you get the, the target of the atomic. Sorry, that's a lot of words. You can probably ignore the past like 10 minutes of me rambling, um, but maybe it helped. The problem we run into here is that um, we're going to keep appending to this linked list, which means we need to keep track of the, the start and end of the linked list that we're constructing. And the pointer to the start of that linked list is owned because we're constructing a new one, but the pointer to the run which we're going to pin at the end is not owned because it's a part of some existing data structure. And Russ is complaining about the fact that these two types are uh, mismatched. Um, and so how are we going to do this? Uh, hmm. That is a good question. Um, <laughs> this next, the next pointer what we're doing here is we're taking the run and we're sticking stuff, we're sticking all the other things that belong in the same bin to the start of it. Um, so the type of this next pointer is going to be an atomic pointer. So how do we get the atomic pointer for the run that we extracted? Well, in theory, we could get that out right here. So what is the head? Hmm. Yeah, we need to find a way to get, we, we want not a, Trying to figure out how to draw this to explain it better. Um, here, let me try. Um, so here's the problem we run into. Oh man, I wish I had my buttons back. Um, here's the problem we run into. So this is our node type. Uh, node has a next, a next pointer. Uh, and logically, there's a there's another node where the next points to that node, right? In reality, though. Um, This, okay, so the type of this thing is atomic, um, which really just means that it is a, um, uh, that it is a pointer. That's all it really means. Um, but 
this value, the, the, the address stored in the pointer can change arbitrarily, um, right? Because it might be accessed from multiple threads. And so when we do uh, an atomic load, what that means is look at, it, you can think of this as like, look at the pointer to this thing and do an atomic read of what the current pointer is. And the value of this, this is gonna return a shared. And the shared is gonna contain this value at the time of the read. So even though the, the value of the atomic is this pointer and the value of the shared is also this pointer, there's a distinction in that um, the atomic itself uh, its value, it's, think of it as, can constantly be changing. And when we load, what we get is the snapshot of the pointer value at some point in time. And that is what's stored and shared. So you might do atomic.load, get one shared, uh, get a shared with a particular address. You might then do a subsequent atomic load with a different shared address. When we are constructing our new node uh, over here, right? Um, and imagine that this has been identified as a run. What is its next pointer going to be? Well, its next pointer is going to be pointing to this. Uh, but this business here is also going to be an atomic. It's not going to be the same atomic, right? These are different points in memory. Um, but it does have to have the same value. which I think means that we can just use atomic new. Um, because it doesn't matter that it's not the same atomic, really. Um, which means that down here, I believe, let's just look up um, atomic. Does that have a from shared? Great. Yeah, so this is just going to be atomic from uh, like. Expected node found mutable reference. Ah, yes, this is going to be a star. No implementation for U64 and I size. Oh, well, so, okay, so this is another bit that's a little awkward. Um, actually, no, this should be fine. Why is N here an I size? Why are either of these an I size? What did it say? U64 and I size. So N is an I size. Why is N an I size? Where does N come from? N. Lens, so it should be a U size. So why is it saying that it's an I size? Although reading from the other code, we can just do uh, as U64. But I'm not sure why it thinks it's an I size. It really shouldn't be. Um, All right, binary operation cannot be applied to node 465. Uh, well, p not equal to last run. This um, this is a pointer equality is what we want here. Uh, so we don't actually want to compare whether. Remember in Rust, if you do like um, uh, if you do if you have x of type reference to a node and y of type reference to a node and then you do x equals to y um, what that will turn into is like x dot eek y right that's what Rust is going to turn it into whereas here what we want to do is iterate until we reach the pointer that points to the the place where we found a run and so we actually want a pointer equality here we don't want it to use the equality implementation for node uh, so there's a pointer eek, I think. 
So let's just do this. Um, expected shared found reference. Okay, so last run here. Why is last run a reference? Head. Uh, why is head not a shared? It's a great question. So lobe in here, these are both shared because they're, they're shared pointers. Last run should also be a shared. Not sure why it thinks that's not the case. Yeah, there's a, it's thinking that, so head for whatever reason is, um, is a reference and not a shared, which sounds wrong. Where does head come from here? I think I'm blind. Uh, oh, there. Oh, I see. Um, Yeah, so the, the trick here is this dereference. So so bin here is a shared a shared to um a bin entry. But we're dereferencing here, which is gonna be an unsafe operation. But that gives us what what's inside here is a uh is a node. It's a, so this is a normal reference, not a shared, because of this unsafe deref. So I think what we want to do here is say Lead is head is shared from uh, head. I'm going to turn it back into a shared because it came from a shared. Um, uh, a no field next on shared. So this is DREF. Uh, no field value on shared. That's DREF. Um, Four sixty seven. Yeah, so this is going to be, uh, how do I, from a shared, give me a shared, how do I get its pointer, just as raw. Uh, and P is also going to be as raw. Yeah, so this is DREF, 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 DREF. Um, this, oh, it's not letting me do this because I need to do that, which is fine. Um, DREF, DREF. This is not a DREF. Compare and swap. So this is going to take an ordering. That's fine. Uh, this is fine. This is just uh, this is part of the garbage collection business that we talked about earlier. So that's also going to have to do with DREF. Um, swap up here. That's missing something. Expected three parameters. Uh, probably requires a guard, right? Uh, give me atomic. Swap takes a guard as the last argument. Okay. 382. Uh, owned does not have a null. Okay. So let's look for owned. Oh, interesting. There is no owned null. 
So if I have a an atomic, how do I set it to null? Uh, store just takes anything that's a pointer. And shared implements pointer, so this can just be shared null. That's fine. Um, 361. I size minus U size. That's fine. Actually, let's just do where is stride? That's going to be an I size. Can make that easier. Uh, what else do we have that is DREF? Okay, that's a DREF. Uh, 334. Null garbage. This is going to have to be a swap because we want the old value. So we need to get the we need to get the ta the value that was there because that is now garbage. That's fine. Um 333 three, three. and Yep, that's fine. 330 um method not found into boxed. So what is vec? So the the notion here is I want to take, I have a vector. This is when we initially allocate the, the set of bins. We have a vector of bin entries. And we want to, we want to basically remove the ability to resize it. Um, and I believe there's a method into box slice. That's what I want. which basically removes the vec wrapper and turns it into a box slice instead. Um, 309, transfer, that's gonna take a guard. Um, 304, that's gonna take a guard. Mm, 291. Max resizers. That's going to be an I size as well. Um, 288. Resize stamp. It's going to be an I size. Although, that really should be a U size. I think what I really want here is. Um, wait, what? Why is there a comparison between I size and U size here? Uh, uh, partial eek for shared uses pointer equality. Oh, nice. Then we can just do uh, this. Uh, all right. So why is it claiming that it can't compare those? I'm not trying to compare them. Is it getting confused by this somehow? All right, let's leave that for now. Uh, this is DREF 270. That seems like a count. Uh, as I size. That's fine. Uh, 241, guard. Uh, 233. Expected I size, found U size. Max resizers. I size plus U size. But max resizers is 
an eye size, right? Yeah, that's weird. Uh, 229 is complaining about expected guard found ordering. That's because the order of these is wrong, which means the order of this is also wrong. Um, 227, uh, this is a DREF, 207, expected option found integer, uh, should be sum and count, 198, like this. Uh, this is going to be the same thing as before, where here we need to say let uh, head is shared from head as const. This is just to sort of reapply the shared wrapping uh, after we undid it up here. Um, let's see what that gives us. Oh, there are certainly fewer now. Uh, 311. The guard comes from up here. Uh, this probably needs to take guard. Let's have that just use the guard that it's given rather than make up its own guard. All right, what else do we have? Uh, 209, this takes a guard. Um, that's a DREF, DREF. That is not a DREF. No field, uh, no field value on type owned. Well, that is certainly interesting. Um, own should have, own should implement DREF though, right? Uh, yeah. Am I missing something here? Oh, bin entry. Bin entry can also be a forward. So how do we know this is not forward? Where is this code? This is um, in put. The existing value. Old value node. What is this doing? Why is this even using node? Ah, node is the thing that we construct up here. And so we actually know that it's a, we know it's a bin entry node. Um, so here, what we can do is uh, let owned uh, bin, uh, we're gonna do entry node node value we can destruct it here because we know that that is what we constructed in the first place uh, and this is unreachable and then this can just use the value um, 211 missing guard or not missing guard expected reference found guard all right, where's this guard coming from? Oh, let's just make this be a reference. Um, 
boxed slice, pointer to slice. In other words, slice. Yeah, a boxed slice is a um, an owned pointer to a heap allocated slice. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. DRF, 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 DRF. One eighty six. Uh, this is going to be owned. Actually, can I destructure owned? I cannot. Hmm. Oh, but I can do into box. Into box. Which is what I want to do. Uh, no field key, this is 182. Oh, that's really awkward. Uh, Yeah, we need to like, ugh, that's awful. Node ref key ref hash. Then key hash. It's because the, the code doesn't know that the value we've constructed to be put into the map or into the uh, into the linked list is of type bin entry node. It doesn't know that it's not bin entry forward or moved, for example. So we need to reachable. Uh, so we need to tell it that that is the case. And then uh, once we've done that, then now we can use the hash and the key. Uh, and I guess we can actually do this. So that you don't have to do it each time. Uh, a lot of DRFs. Uh, DRF, 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 DRF. DRF. No field lock. That's also DRF. No field key, though. That is different. So up here. Uh, this is the same issue actually where, hmm, I think actually what we want to do here is probably this, just hoist that all the way out. Uh, and then up here in this guard. This is going to be key, which means I guess mm, 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 mm. this can probably be moved even further out. This can be all the way up here. Uh, and I think we only need the key. Oops. This is basically to give us easy access to the key um, while we are, right? We, we take the key that the user gives us and we stick it in this in this node, uh, but we want still want to be able to easily compare against the key. Um, and so we, we just take a reference out to it down here. Um, and now in these places, we can now use the key uh, this is just going to be H for hash. And then I think we're good. All right, let's try that. Um, what else are we missing up here? Um, 162, that one we fixed. Um, 159 this is going to include the guard. Uh, 139 is going to include the guard down here um, this is DRF oh actually be 
that. Um, DRF, 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 init table has not been found. All right, so this is a function that we're missing, init table. Interesting. So we do actually have to implement this function. Should be easy enough though. Uh, init table. And I guess it's gonna return a shared table. That's the idea. Um, this is probably pretty straightforward. This is just, um, you decide that you have to allocate a new table, uh, which which only one thread should be doing. So I think what it's doing here is, is sort of double checking that there is in fact no table, or that the table is empty, and then it uh, it tries it checks that no one else is trying to do the the table initialization, um, and yeah, it just allocates the new table. Great. So this should be straightforward. Um, here we can just do while uh, self dot table load. Um, ordering, I guess this is probably also gonna have to take a guard um, while this is null. It's going to have to be a loop. The table is going to be that. Uh, if table if table is not null, or uh, and table dot bins dot is empty. So basically, if there is a table that's not empty, then we can just return that table. Um, otherwise, try to allocate the table, uh, which is gonna, which we're gonna do by doing sc is size ctl load. Uh, it's gonna take a guard. So we're basically going to check the the control bits to make sure that no one else is trying to try and initialize the table at the same time. Um, if sc is less than zero, uh, we lost the init initialization race. Uh, just spin. So that's going to be a thread yield now and a continue. Right, so here, what we're really doing is we know that someone else is allocating the table for the first time. So we're just gonna yield so that someone else gets to run if they can. Uh, and then we're just gonna try to load the table again and presumably return pretty quickly. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna try to become the people who initialize the table, which we're gonna do by doing a compare and swap on the, the control bit to basically make us the initializer. And we're gonna do that by taking the old SC uh, and replacing it with minus one uh, with ordering set const. And if, that, if we succeed at that compare and swap, then we get to do it. Let's see, so what does this do? Oh, so at this point we need to double check this business. Uh, interesting. So this is, if the table is null, or the table is empty, then we're gonna allocate it. 
otherwise. Uh, so th think of this, the size CTL is sort of like a lock here. Um, and so we need to recheck the conditions under which we initialize the table after we took the lock. Um, right, so this compare and swap, if it succeeds, we sort of have the initialization lock. And now we need to check that initialization is actually still uh, necessary. Um, and down here, we're going to do a size CTL uh, store SC. Um, think of this as releasing the lock. And in here, what are we going to do? Uh, N is if SC is greater than zero, then SC else default capacity. Huh. And then this is going to be the allocation, which is similar to what we did um, under resizing. New table is going to be this. Uh, And now we're going to do, let's see here, um, this is going to return table. I guess actually we can just break here instead, given that this is a loop. Um, so in this case, table is going to be, uh, I guess, self.table.store, because we're going to store this as the new table. Um, and we don't need to worry about deallocating the old one, because we've already checked that there wasn't anything there. Um, so we're just going to do this. We're just going to store it straight ahead. Um, and I guess actually we could take a shared from it as well. Um, so if I have an owned, can I get a shared? Yes. So we're going to do uh, table is new table into shared. Uh, and then this is going to be store table. see if that's going to work. And then SC So remember SC is a sort of weird weird value where um, if it's negative then it's uh, then it's used to also count how many people are helping then there's a resize and it's used to count how many people are helping with the resize. If it is not negative, it is the next capacity to resize to. It's a really weird value. Um, and so here, because we allocated the table, um, we're going to set it to um, n minus n shift right to. Um, not sure why. Oh, it's. Um, I think it's actually how many threads are going to help with the resize. It's not the next size. Although, yeah, it's unclear. All right, well, in any case, this is what it does. Uh, I wonder why this is a try. Not clear. OK, but that is going to allocate our table for us. And we break with the table. And we return. All right. Now, what's it going to complain about? Um, that's DREF, 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 DREF. That's not a DREF. 56. Uh, couldn't that peculiarity be encoded through the type system to avoid future confusion? Um, so one thing that's awkward about this kind of highly concurrent code is that you often 
the, the you you're relying on what the CPU lets you do atomically. Uh, and in this case, um, and usually the CPU will only let you do atomic operations on things that are word sized. Uh, so basically, if you have like if you have a 64 bit processor, you can only do atomic things on things that are 64 bits or sometimes slightly smaller. Um, which means that it's not arbitrary types that we can do these atomic operations on. And the size control field is used uh, sort of in a hev heavily in an atomic sense, right? It's used basically as a lock. And so while it would be nice if it was a type that we can control ourselves, and like it was an enum and you got all these nice properties, if we did, we couldn't have these atomic operations on it, or we would have to use something more heavyweight as a lock to guard it, uh, which might, because it's, such a critical piece of the concurrency business, um, that would become a very highly contended operation. Um, now, it could be that we could just replace it with a lock and it would be fine, given that it's doing compare and swaps anyway. Um, but I think we're gonna, we're gonna assume that the authors of the Java version were like, we don't want to lock the size control field. We want to do atomic operations on it. And because that is the case, we can't have it be an arbitrary type, unfortunately. Uh, 156, what's it complaining about here? Bin entry node has no field next. That is true, node does. 155, I'm just gonna complain about those fields. That's okay, 147. Expected. Okay, found. Okay, so this has to borrow the key. That's fine. One forty-four insert. This is going to be a self put key value false. So false because uh, we want to allow replacement for insert. Um, one thirty-six. Expected eye size found u size as eye size. That's fine. 134 into shared probably takes a guard. Um, if and else of different parameters. Expected eye size found u size default capacity. because SC can be negative. Actually, uh, so what we're gonna do here is this can be an as u size because we're already checking that it's greater than zero. Uh, this is a deref, 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 deref. And 313. This business. Interpret as generic arguments. Yeah, it thinks that I size takes a generic parameter SC as what it starts to parse this as, but that's not the case. So we need to make it not be confused. Great. And this is not gonna use unsafe cell anymore. All right, so now we need to deal with the Now we need to deal with all these DREFs. Um, and so we're gonna, I'm gonna commit here just so we um, finish up uh, port except for garbage collection. it as well for those of you who are following ho along at home. Nice. Okay, so now we get to a, a real tricky part. Uh, now we're going to have to deal with the garbage collection part of this. And so if you think about it, um, if we never deallocate any data, like if we never free anything, then all of the places that have shareds, that have shared pointers, it's always fine to dereference them. They will always point to valid data, right? Um, and so if we just never collected garbage, 
we could add unsafe DRefs to all the shareds and all of them would always work. That would be great, but that's not quite satisfactory, right? What we really want is we want um, we want to deallocate things. Like for example, if we do a table resize, we want to eventually deallocate the old the old table, the old set of bins, right? Uh, if we remove a value from the map or replace a value in the map, we want the old value to eventually be deallocated. But once you do that, now you need to be really careful that if you ever have a shared pointer, that the moment you dereference it, you know that it's going to remain valid. Uh, and so that is what this next bit is going to be about. This is a great place where we're going to take a short break for me to like go pee and make tea. Um, I'll, I'll also annotate this in the in the video itself that people can jump to this point. Um, so I'm going to run get tea. Everyone go pee and do whatever you need to do. Um, if you have questions about what we've done so far or what we're doing next, now is a great time. We'll take just like a short bit for me to go through any additional points of confusion that you might have. All right. So short break time. I should really have like elevator music, uh, but I'll be back in a second. We are alone. Um, any way to specify an enum type represented a 64-bit int and do the atomic ops with it? Uh, you can make make a, an enum like a, a wrapper. Um, one issue we would run into here is I don't think it would help us much. Because here, like SC, we really want to say something like, it is either negative or positive. Actually, we wouldn't have to stick to that. It, it might be possible to do that and sort of use the high bit as the enum discriminant. I think it would basically end up with you would op be operating on that enum as if it were a number anyway, and it wouldn't really help you um, because you wouldn't be able to do things like pattern matching because the, the way in which you would know which variant you're in would you would have to like read out uh, numbers. What we could do is maybe do a new type around SC um, and have that have some like uh, helpful method names for things like like um, t take control or like methods that under the hood did these atomic operations on the number. Um, so that might be something we could do. Uh, Uh, so Erwin, I'm about to go through what the plan for garbage collection is. Um, so I'll do that in like a bit. I think the T is done. And then I will, then we will dive headfirst into garbage.
let's see here. Um, so any any further questions about like the code we've written so far, what the plan is, sort of anything about um, uh, what we're about to do, or th does the explanation of why um, why dereferencing shared is safe if you never collect anything? Does that make sense? I'm going to take the silence as a yes. Um, okay, so here's where it gets tricky. Um, there are a couple of places in the code that we've annotated with, let me see if I can dig one up here, for example. Uh, arguably, I can close this now. Yeah, let's close that. Um, there are a couple of places where we generate garbage. Uh, this particular example is we are doing an insert and there is already a value for the key that we're trying to do an insert for. Uh, and so we need to drop the old value or we're going to replace that value, which means that the value that was there is going to go away. Um, and like if that value is going away, uh, it should be dropped eventually. But the problem is we can't drop it immediately because there might be other threads that are reading that value concurrently with us. And so the question becomes, when is it safe to drop that value? Uh, and there are many, many strategies for dealing with this. Mm. One such strategy is um, if you have a garbage collected language like Java, mm, the language has a runtime that tracks whether there exist pointers to basically every object, everything that you ever allocate, um, the runtime is going to keep track of whether you have any pointers to it and whether there are no more pointers to it. So there's no way for someone to reach that value. Only then does it get destroyed. Um, in Rust, we don't really have this luxury because we don't have a runtime. We don't have something that's running in the background and knows what pointers everyone has. Um, which means that we need to have some other strategy for when do you know that it's safe to drop a value? Um, there are many strategies to do this without a runtime. Uh, and there's sort of all this research literature you could look into. What we're going to do is we're going to use um, one that comes with Crossbeam. We talked a little bit about this in the very early days uh, of this port. Let me make that larger and easier to read. Um, and so I actually, I, I recommend you read this text while I eat some pineapple. Um, because this is basically exactly the strategy we're going to take. Mm. But the premise here is that anytime some thread is going to start doing stuff with the map, um, and, and doing stuff can be do a read, do a write, anytime it, the, basically from the point when it does it, its first pointer read from the map, and so now has a live pointer into that map, or any descendant data structures. From that point, we're gonna sort of, we're gonna assert that that thread is in a given epoch. Um, and when it releases the last of the pointers it has into the map, even sort of transitively deep down, then we're gonna say that um, that thread is now done with that epoch. What this means is uh, you're gonna have multiple threads and all of them are gonna be entering and leaving epochs. Um, it's not technically true. They're going to be pinning and unpinning epics is usually the way it's phrased. Um, and as long as an epic is pinned, any garbage that's produced in it will not be freed. So um, imagine that we are current, we start in epic one. Uh, and in epic one, some thread pins the epic. So now we are not allowed to move on from epic one. Epic one is going to stay around for a while. Or we, we can move on, but. If that thread or any other thread generates garbage in epic one, that's going to be stored in like the epic one garbage bin. Uh, and as long as anyone still has pointers into epic one, um, that garbage is going to stay around. So any pointers into it is going to be valid because the objects haven't been deallocated. When there are no threads left that have pinned epic one, epic one is considered complete or closed or ended. 
at that point, we know that that garbage is no longer reachable by anyone. Because if you entered after the garbage was generated, you would have entered in Epoch 2. And if you entered in Epoch 2, you can't have reached the garbage because it was already removed. And so once all threads have unpinned Epoch 1, any garbage that was generated in Epoch 1 is no longer reachable by anyone because everyone who's in Epoch 2 must have happened after the removal happened. And so therefore it's safe to remove that garbage uh, and free those objects. Um, and so this is what's known as an epic based garbage collection scheme. We're going to generate garbage in epics, and we're only going to free the garbage in a given epic when every thread has moved on from that epic. Uh, and because all reads need, this is what the guard is for, in order to generate a guard, you pin the epic. And so you know that no one is going to, no, nothing you read is going to be garbage collected. Right, because I'm going to pin the epic, uh, and then I'm going to do a bunch of reads. And if someone deletes any of that stuff, it gets deleted in the current epic because I've pinned the epic. So the garbage gets generated in my epic. And that means that any pointers I read in that epic are going to remain valid for as long as that epic is open. At some point, I'm going to... Uh, and so I, I can traverse these pointers just fine, and I know that all of them are safe to, to access. Then at some point, I'm going to give up the epic. I'm going to or give up my pin of that epic. Then I don't have any pointers to anymore. So for me, it's fine if any of that garbage is now freed. As long as that is the case for all threads, this should all be safe. Um, did that roughly make sense? Should I try to draw it? Would that help? Pedantic on my pronunciation. Sure, go ahead. Mm. Does this mean that this strategy tends to accumulate more garbage on average over time than traditional GC, but less bookkeeping is necessary? Mm. Sort of. Um, uh, epic and epoch, they're both valid pronunciations for epic, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, epic based garbage collection doesn't necessarily accumulate more garbage. Um, the amount of garbage is is independent of the strategy used to reclaim the garbage. The question is, how long does it take for garbage to be rec um, reclaimed? Uh, or s phrased differently, how long does it take between something gets deleted and it actually gets dropped? And th this is a product of two different things. One is, obviously, it's not going to get freed until it can be freed. Right? So the, the time between when I remove something and it actually gets removed is going to depend on if there are other readers that hold on to it. If like someone is holding on to it for the duration of the program, it's never going to get freed. And that's fine. It's unfortunate, but fine. Uh, so th that amount of time is not that interesting. What's interesting is how long does it take from when no one has a pointer to a piece of garbage uh, until that garbage is reclaimed? Um, and so uh, that period of time is determined by your garbage collection scheme. Uh, if you use a garbage collected language, they have different schemes internally too. Like they could, you can implement a, a runtime garbage collector using epics. Uh, you can use, um, you can do it using sort of generational GC. Um, there's sort of stop the world GC, mark and sweep. There are all these strategies and they all have different properties in this regard. Um, very often a garbage collected language, like a, a runtime garbage collector, is not going to free anything immediately. Not at all. It's going to try to, um, uh, what's the word, amortize the cost of collecting that garbage. So it will also introduce a delay. Uh, the other extreme of this is if you use something like reference counting. Reference counting is a garbage collection scheme. If I have a reference counted value, what that means is at some point, I will know that no one has a pointer to it anymore because the reference count went to zero. And the moment that happened, I'm going to free it. So in a reference counted scheme, garbage is destroyed immediately once you can. But that can also mean that you don't get to amortize the cost of deallocating things because you must deallocate them immediately. 
An epic-based scheme is does not have more or less garbage at any given time than a runtime garbage collector. Um, the only thing that's tricky about uh, an epic-based garbage collection is that it is um, uh, it is sort of based on cooperation. So I mentioned that a thread can choose to pin the epic and then release that pin. Well, imagine that some thread pins the epic and then runs for a really long time with the epic pinned. Well, if they do, any garbage that's accumulated is just going to sit around waiting for that one thread. And so it requires that the, the pieces that are using your epic-based memory reclamation are cooperative in some sense, that they don't hold on to a pin for longer than they need. This is also why if you look at um, guard, uh, guard has this method called repin. And what repin does is it releases the pin and then immediately takes it again. And this can be useful because if you repin, um, you allow the epic to move on, right? So um, because you take immutable reference to the guard, that means that any anything that was using, was dependent on the guard um, is now no longer valid. The borrow checker is going to check that. And you're going to release the, the current epic you had pinned and then immediately pin whatever is now the next epic. And so this is the way that if you have a thread that's like really busy doing some operations, it can occasionally repin in order to let garbage be collected. Um, do all previous epics have to be unpinned? That is, if epic one is still pinned by some thread, we are in epic three and epic two has some garbage and no one has pinned two, could it be freed? Um, not quite. So you can't, um, this depends a little bit on the exact scheme. Let me see if, if it says here. Uh, yeah, so th there is a global epic and you are pinning the global epic. So that means that if I pin epic one, um, no one is moving on. We are staying in epic one until everyone has moved on from epic one. And so it's not, it's not as though every thread has its own epic. It's that either you are in the current, the pin, the current epic, or you are in the next epic. And once all the threads are in the next epic, then the next epic becomes the global epic, if that makes sense. Uh, so there, there usually aren't many epics. Um, there could be, in theory, you could, you could do sort of generational epics, but I don't think that's what um, Crossbeam does because it gets, re gets really hard to keep track of. Does that make sense? Okay, in that case, we're gonna try to do this. Mm. So, the um, the gist of Crossbeam's um, epic-based reclamation is that when you have a guard, or whenever you load a value, you have to give a guard um, to say that I this I load this value and it's protected by this guard, and the guard of course pins the epic. So it's sort of like the, the read I'm doing now is going to remain valid for the current epic. Um, and you'll see that there's this uh, defer destroy. So defer destroy is I say this value is now garbage. Um, whenever the epic moves on, you should feel free to free it. And then Crossbeam will under the hood take care of that freeing whenever all the threads have unpinned the, the previous epic, so to speak. Um, and so what we need to do is use the guards defer destroy in the appropriate places where we generate garbage. Um, and in theory, that should be, uh, this pin has nothing to do with standard pin, by the way. The, these are separate concepts. Um, so any place that we generate garbage, uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so the phrasing here is important. There is no guarantee when exactly the destructor will be executed. This is if we mark if we do a defer destroy. 
The only guarantee is that it won't be executed until all currently pinned threads get unpinned, right? Okay, so this is really important. Um, the moment we mark this as garbage, so when I do guard dot uh, defer destroy, now garbage. Um, I like to annotate any unsafe code with a, um, a statement about why it is actually unsafe. Um, so in this case, why, what we need to argue is, um, well, actually let's double check that I'm not being stupid. Um, so for safety, the object must not be reachable by other threads anymore. Otherwise it might still be in use when the destructor runs. Um, and the value must be sendable. The value must be sendable. That's going to be its own kind of interesting. Uh, okay, so we're going to require, actually, this is a little awkward. Um, we're going to have to require that the value is send. It's also going to have to be sync, obviously. Uh, and I think the key is also going to have to be sync. Um, okay, so the safety we need to promise here, uh, need to guarantee that uh, now garbage is no longer reachable. Um, More specifically, um, no thread that executes after this line can ever get a reference to no garbage. Um, well, let's think about whether this is true. Um, so think about a thread that, uh, a thread that already pinned its epic might have a pointer to this garbage, right? Think about what happens if, um, a reader reads this value, um, and then we replace it. So we mark it as garbage. Um, that old thread still has a reference to it. So it's not safe to drop. And so the question is, is this defer destroy still safe? Um, and the argument is that, well, <clears throat> if someone has already pinned the current epic, or phrased differently, we have pinned the current epic. That means that no one else is going to get, um, a anyone else who pins the epic is also going to get the current epic. So if someone else reads this value that is prior to the line where we swap it out, when we swap it out, no one else can see it. Right, so any future thread, any one of the pins in the future, uh, they are not going to be able to access this value. It's only about threads that are executed before this line because they are the only ones that might have seen that value and have references to it. So any previous thread must have pinned what, either before we took our guard or while our guard was active. That means that they must be in the same epoch that we are or in an earlier one. And because that is the case, we know that this garbage is generated as of the current epic. So it won't be freed until the next epic. And we, are, we just said that any thread that has seen this value, has a reference to this value, must be in a previous epic. And therefore, the safety is promised. Let's see if I can phrase this for the purposes of the comment. Uh, no thread that executes after uh, this line can ever get reference to now garbage. Um, we are the there are uh, here are the possible cases. It's like a useful exercise in uh, 
uh, a useful exercise in like working through safety issues. Um, another thread already has a reference to now garbage. Well, they must have read <clears throat> before swap, before the call to swap. Uh, this means their, uh, their guard must have been taken uh, Either uh, their guard was taken before it was created, uh, before our guard. In that case, actually, this is not a separate one. Either the guard was created before our guard, uh, in which case, um, Another thread already has a reference to not garbage. They must have, they must have read before read it before the call to swap. Either um, because of this, they that thread must be pinned to less than or equal to to an epoch less than or equal to the epic of our guard um, since the garbage is placed in our epic it won't be freed until the next epic at which point that thread must have um, dropped its guard and with it any reference to the value. Uh, the other case is another thread is uh, about to get a reference to this value. Uh, they execute after the swap and therefore do not get a reference to the value. So free to no garbage, they get value instead. So freeing now garbage is fine. All right, so that is the argument for why uh, freeing here is safe. Does that argument make sense? Don't you need to guarantee that the swap pointer was unique, not stored in any other shared place? Mm. Yes, that is also true. Um, we need to guarantee that this pointer, this now garbage pointer, is this distinct. Um, is not ex uh, There are no other ways to get to um, a value except through its node, which is what we swapped. Through its nodes value field is what we swapped. So free now we're just fine. Yeah, so there's a there's a requirement that there's no other path to that value either. If there were, it would be a problem. All right. Where's the other one? So that was for freeing values. And this one, um, 
Ooh. I feel like we're missing a case here. Mm. So here, this is, um, we've done a resize and the resize is finished. So that is, um, mm -hmm. yeah, this is the resize is finished. Uh, so the next table becomes the current table uh, and the old table needs to be freed. Right. This is the, the vect that we did like into box slice for. So that needs to be freed somehow. How are we going to do that? Well, um, so here we're going to have an unsafe guard defer destroy garbage. I think I want this to be actually, no, that's great. Safety. <clears throat> Uh, so this one is a little trickier to, to argue because here, um, we need to guarantee that, uh, actually we, we need to guarantee the same thing, right? So let me grab the safety from before, All right? So this is the property we need to guarantee, uh, that now garbage is no longer re reachable, uh, no thread that executes after uh, this line can ever get a reference to no garbage, right? So the, the safety property we need to uphold is the same. And so here are the possible cases. Either, um, if I, let's copy the cases as well. The argument isn't quite the same. Um, well, actually the argument is pretty similar. Another thread already has a reference to now garbage. Uh, they must have read it before the call to swap. Right, so that is certainly true. Um, uh, because of this, that thread must be pinned to an epoch that's less than or equal to the epoch of our guard. Since the garbage is placed in our epoch, it won't be freed until the next epoch, at which point that thread must adopt its guard and with it any reference to the value. Um, so that holds true here as well. If someone else has a reference to what is now garbage, it must be because they read self.table in the past, um, which means that they are tied to an epic in the past, which means that as long as we drop in the next epic, we're all good. Uh, oh, you can indent unindent with a, the number of lines followed by double angle bracket left or double angle bracket right. But in this case, it's just Rust format that does it for me. Um, the other case, uh, is, and this is where the safety really comes, uh, comes up is we need to guarantee that another thread that's about to get a reference to this value won't get a reference to this value. Um, so how can we guarantee that? Well, Actually, let's do this uh, first. We need to argue that um, self.table uh, is the only way to get to uh, that there is no other way to get to self.table. Uh, to get, sorry, to get to now garbage, right? So this is the uniqueness property that we need to guarantee. We, we can't free something if, or we can't, we can't give this guarantee that no other thread is going to get to now garbage um, unless we give the argument for why. Well, uh, it is not accessible through self.table anymore. Uh, it cannot be, ex uh, it is not accessible through self next table anymore. Um, 
what about forwarding nodes? So this is uh, bin entry moved. Uh, well, okay, so the, the argument here is there are going to be some bin entry moves that, or there might be some bin entry moves that point into now garbage. Because remember, bin entry moved is, um, uh, is, bin entry moved is, uh, just contains a reference, just a, a raw pointer to the table that you're going to go search in. Um, well, for a uh, only bin entry moved um, that existed before, uh, well, the only bin entry moved that point to now garbage are the ones in previous tables. Uh, or I guess let's call it earlier table. Uh, previous tables is good. Uh, to get to those previous tables, you must go, uh, one must ultimately have arrived through self.table because that's where all operations start. Uh, start their search. Uh, since self.table has now changed, uh, only old threads uh, can still be accessing them. Um, it's now changed. Only old threads can still be accessing them. No new thread can get to uh, past tables. No new thread can get to past tables, uh, and therefore they also cannot get to moved that point to now garbage. So we're fine. Um, it seems like Rust is not helping as much as it could using this allocation scheme. Maintaining these invariants seem hard to reason about. That's true. Uh, for for this kind of low-level concurrency, like this is just unsafe code. Uh, and it, it sort of has to be. Think of it this way. Um, unsafe code is, it's there in order to let you write code that relies on invariants that the compiler cannot check for you. And it's totally true that the Rust borrow checker just like does not understand what we're doing here. Remember, we're relying on really intricate concurrency properties here, right? We're relying on things like the relative ordering between different or, uh, atomic operations or control of like the size control field, right? Um, and these are things that the, the compiler doesn't know this. This is why for many of these data structures, like people have written long research papers about writing formal proofs for why they're correct. Um, and so the Rust compiler doesn't really help us that much here. Now it does help us in some regards, right? Like this, this, um, this sort of guard and shared scheme does help. It does mean that it's harder to write incorrect code, but it does not by any means make it impossible. But it does mean that any code that might be incorrect is gonna be marked as unsafe. Um, there are also some other things that this saves us completely from, right? Like the putting the restriction that um, the key and the value are sync and that the value is send. Uh, in fact, I think the key also has to be send now that I think about it. Uh, because it might be deallocated by a different thread. Um, uh, so these properties, the compiler just has no chance of checking for you. Uh, but that's why it's nice. The Rust provides this sort of escape hatch of, uh, if you know, if you think you know better, like, you know that the invariant makes sure that this is okay, then go ahead. Um, 
Uh, okay, so actually we can make this argument in a perhaps slightly more useful way, which is we first say, uh, first, uh, let's talk about threads with existing references to now garbage. Uh, such a thread must have read it, must have gotten that reference be call, before the call to swap. Actually, no. Uh, here. Actually, yeah, this is the way to make this argument. Uh, this means that that no future thread, uh, i.e. in a later epic, um, where the value may be freed, uh, can get a reference to now garbage. Uh, next, let's talk about threads with existing references to garbage. S such a thread must have gotten that reference before the call to swap. Because of this, that thread must be pinned to an epic less than or equal to the epic of our guard, since our guard is pinning the epic. Since the garbage is placed in our epic, it won't be freed until the next epic, at which point that thread must have dropped its guard and with it any reference to the value. You'll notice that um, these safety arguments, the safety arguments about uh, when we free stuff, um, that safety argument is really the, the safety argument for both this and for the reads, right? If, because as, as we mentioned before, if all of the, if we never deallocated things, then all of the reads would be safe. Like all of the dereferences would be safe. Um, and so once we make the argument that this deallocation is safe, then that is sort of inherently also the argument why the derefs are safe. Uh, there should be one more of these, which is when you free a bin. Uh, although I can't find that now, which is interesting. Um, One challenge we have with the Rust code compared to the Java code is in the Java code, it, it never actually specifically says where it drops a value, like when it goes out of scope. It just sort of, like it just overwrites the value and then the old value will be garbage collected. Um, so there's definitely at least one memory leak here, which is... Um, down here. Um, here, the old peas. Uh, P is now garbage. Because it has been replaced with the node we allocated above. Right, so this is, you're doing a resize uh, and you're gonna take, the, there's an existing linked list, right? And there's a new linked list and uh, which we're transferring into. And we're gonna, for every node in the old linked list, we're gonna create a node in the new linked list and we're gonna fill it up with the field from the old one. Um, and we, Um, 
And once we've done that, the old linked list, the, the nodes in the old linked list are now garbage, right? Uh, except for the run, which we move wholesale. Um, but we can't free them yet because there might still be someone uh, sort of reading from the old map and, and hence the old, uh, the old bin, the old linked list. So, but it is garbage. Um, and so here we are going to do guard defer destroy uh, p safety um, Is that indentation being weird? That's strange. Um, so what's the safety guarantee here? Uh, first, we need to argue that uh, there is no longer a way to access um, P. which is not actually true. That's only true down here. Yep, that's awkward. So it's not actually there, it's down here. Um, the old uh, bin linked list is now garbage. Everything up to last run in the old bin linked list is now garbage. Um, uh, those nodes have all been reallocated in the new bin linked list. All right, so first, uh, so this is gonna be basically the same while loop as up here. I'm gonna do this business. Um, And then we need to give the safety argument here for why this is actually the case. First, we need to argue that there's no longer a way to access P. Um, so why is that the case? Um, well, it is no longer possible to access P because the only way you would access P is through the table uh, and the table's entry is now moved. Uh, the only way to get to um, P is through uh, table, right? Let me just double check that. Yep, is through table uh, or table I specifically, since table I has been replaced by a moved node um, or move with a bin entry moved, uh, P is no longer accessible. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, next, uh, we need to argue that uh, actually, we can simplify this argument. We need to argue there's no longer a way to access P. Um, any existing reference to P uh, must have been taken before uh, table dot 
store bin uh, at which time we had the epic pinned um, so any threads that have such a reference uh, uh, I don't phrase this better an existing reference to be must have been taken before table.store bin at that time we had the epic pinned um, so any threads that have such a reference must be at uh, at our epoch must be before or at our epoch since the p isn't uh, destroyed until the next epoch um, those old references are fine for are fine since they are tied to uh, the those old threads pins of the old epic. This is basically the same argument uh, for each of these. It's the same argument about why uh, destroying is fine, or or what, rather why old references are fine. New reference is sort of the key safety concern, really. Um, pretty sure there's at least one more missing, and that is um, when the whole table is dropped. So specifically, we're going to have to implement what's that down here? Uh, impl kv drop for table kv. Um, Mm, I missed the word fine. Where? Where did I miss the word fine? I mean, I'm sure I did, but. Um, okay, so this one uh, is a little subtle. Um, here, we're going to have to do for bin in self dot bins. Great, good catch, thanks. Uh, for bin and self bins, um, head here how do I easily get that we're gonna do oh I see okay so this is gonna be um, this is actually gonna be bin I in bin is self bin bin i um, if ah oh, balls I don't have a guard do I mm. Uh, 
Uh, so Erwin, you can use um, Valgrind in in Rust as well. Valgrind works just fine with Rust code. Um, well, so, so okay. So what I'm thinking here is when a table is dropped. Oh, when a table is dropped. Ah, ha, 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 actually, this is much better than I thought. Um, debug assertions. Uh, for bin uh, for this. Uh, assert. Uh, cross beam epic guard epic pin um, assert bin is null or uh, we got a node here I'm going to implement This has moved. So the idea here is um, the idea here is we don't actually need to do anything when we drop a table because if it's dropped because the resize finished then all of them should be moved anyway. Uh, is moved, or I guess has moved. Terrible at spelling. Uh, bins should have been uh, moved or freed by uh, whoever is dropping the table. Um, if table is dropped due to a resize, uh, all bins should have been moved already. If table is dropped due to uh, the whole map being dropped, uh, the uh, map drop Impl should have uh, done the work. Assert bin is null or bin is move. Then the work to destroy everything. So in fact, we don't need to do any of this work here. That's refreshing. We are, however, going to have to do um, impl drop for, I guess it's going to be k, k v s drop for flurry hash map k v s. Um, because when you drop the map, we want to make sure that you still end up dropping all the values and dropping all the bins. Um, we have a huge advantage here though, which is drop takes a mutable reference to self. That means that we know that there's no one anywhere who has any pointer into the map. And uh, there's a special thing in Crossbeam for this, which is, where is it? Guard, guard, uh, epic, unprotected. Um, so this unprotected is used, um, it's basically a way to get a guard that, um, that will immediately destroy anything. Uh, the most common use of this function is with constructing or destructuring a data structure. And the reason of, of course, yeah, exactly. Uh, we can use the dummy guard and the destructor because at that point, no other thread could be concurrently modifying the atomics. Right? Because that would just unnecessarily 
uh, slow things or defer things. So we can do here, we can do guard is crossbeam epic unprotected. Unsafe. Uh, safety. Uh, not concurrently. We have mute self. So not concurrently accessed by anyone else. Nice. Uh, and now what do we want to do? Well, um, we basically want to walk the entire map and go through and free everything or destroy everything. Mm. Um, the question is, what's the best way to do that? I think we're going to assert here. Oh, oh, there's some trickiness here. Like if the map got dropped in the middle of a resize, I think for now, what we're going to do is assert that uh, self dot next table dot load. Um, guard. Uh, ordering const uh, is null. Then we're going to load the table. Uh, then we're going to walk all the bins in the table. Um, then we're going to do bin load guard Ordering. Uh, can you resize to zero? No, I think the resize is only ever growth. I don't think it lets you shrink the map. Although maybe. Uh, that would be nice actually if there was a neat way for us to do that. Um, but not easily, I think. You see, this is like already a growth. I don't know that there's a way to shrink it after, which is perhaps unfortunate, but l luckily this code is going to be fairly straightforward because it doesn't really need to do that much. Um, specifically, um, if bin is null, continue. Uh, all it really needs to do here is do... Um, here, this business. Let mute P is bin. Uh, all not P is null. And here, the safety argument is actually pretty simple. Uh, we're dropping the map, the entire map, so no one else is accessing it. Uh, we are also uh, leaving, actually, Technically here, we could do like a, we kind of want to leave in place a sort of destroyed here, although it shouldn't really matter. Um, mute p is bin not load. Because uh, here we can just do like a, in fact, that's perfect. We just store a, we just store this. Actually, which is even better, we can just swap this with a shared null. We also replace the bin with a null. So there's 
no future way to access it either. Um, one thing that's missing is uh, we also need uh, this load needs to go before. Because otherwise uh, the drop here would drop that piece. We wouldn't be able to access p.next. Oh, yeah, yeah, the same argument came in chat. Um, there's another thing missing here which is that um, we want to, uh, where's the value? Um, yeah, the value itself is also an atomic, uh, p dot value dot, uh, swap null guard ordering set const. Uh, value. And then we're going to guard defer destroy the value. First, drop the value. Uh, in this node. Although there's another thing missing here, which is um, ooh, that's awkward. Um, this is actually we're gonna have to match on p here. We're gonna do if uh, bear with me here for a second. P is if let bin entry uh, moves is bin. Uh, actually, this can just be a match. If it's a bin entry moved, uh, then we just want to drop the value immediately and we don't actually need to do any of this like recursing. Um, so if it's a moved, we just do this uh, bin. Um, and if it's a bin entry node, then we actually need to, then we actually need to walk the the list this is going to be a new so actually we're going to do this i think uh of head is shared from head Um, right, so the, the drop here is we walk all the bins, we swap each bin for a null because we're going to empty it out anyway. Uh, we have to look at what was in the bin. If the bin was just a moved entry, then we can just destroy that bin with without thinking any more about it. If that bin was actually a, the head of a linked list, uh, then we're going to have to walk the linked list, drop the values as we go, uh, and drop the nodes as we go. Um, and what we want to do here, I guess, uh, safety below, we replace the bin with a null. We own the and we own all the nodes in the list. Find the next, then we uh, move to the next uh, node and drop the one we passed through. Um, 
All right, so that should indeed, that should free all the things. All right, so now is there anywhere else where we drop a value? When you resize, you drop the, the old bins, the old nodes in the linked list, and uh, then you drop the old table, but at that point it should be all empty. Actually, that's not true. There's one thing we're missing, and that is... Um, and that is down here. Um, we do have to drop the, if the head of the linked list is one of those is like forward pointers, we still need to drop that head. Uh, so this is actually not entirely true. Uh, so this is going to be unsafe, uh, epic, uh, unprotected, uh, safety. Uh, no one else is accessing this table anymore. Um, so we own all its contents, which is all we are going to use this guard for. Um, so this is, we need to drop all, drop uh, any forwarding nodes since they are heap allocated. And we're just going to do a straight up for bin in self bins. Um, we're going to do bin is bin dot, I guess, swap. I'm just going to leave null pointers behind because there's no real reason not to. Uh, sure, we can do a sequential consistent here. Um, and if bin has moved, or I don't think we even need this has moved function. If let um, bin dot is null, then we just continue. If let uh, bin entry moved is bin, then we want to free it. So this is going to be a defer destroy um, of bin. And that is unsafe. Uh, it's safe by the same safety property we gave above. Uh, otherwise, um, this should be unreachable. Uh, dropped table with uh, non-empty bin. Let's see what that gives us. Uh, All right, so the, the dereps are still missing, right? We just want to check that the that we haven't broken any of the things for, uh, here's one. Uh, this should be guard and guard. I always get the ordering of these wrong. It's annoying. Um, these are all dereps. Deref, deref, deref. That's fine. Uh, 158 is missing lock, which is going to be, what do we say that this lock type was? It's a parking lot mutex. Um, 160. It's an atomic new. There's DRF, 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 DRF. And 620 is going to be cross beam. 
see what that does. Deref, deref, deref. 163, new, empty. Great. Okay, so I think all the remaining ones are derefs. So now let's think through it one more time. Is there anything el anywhere else where we drop values? You do a resize, and when you do a resize, um, eventually the old table is getting freed that we've dealt with. Um, and when the old table gets freed, it's, um, it's bin heads that are forwards must be freed. We've dealt with that. Um, if a value gets replaced, the old value gets freed. We've dealt with that. Um, if the map itself gets dropped, then we need to drop all of the entries. We've dealt with that and all of their values. And we've dealt with that. Okay, so I think this means that we now have all of the, uh, all of the destruction in place. And so now, uh, let's do um, let's do a save for that. Uh, all um, at all uh, garbage collection logic. Okay, so the one thing that's now missing is that, as we've talked about before, shared does not actually implement deref, right? And so that's why we're getting all of these errors. It's because dereferencing a, a shared, which is the raw pointer to into a reference into the inner value uh, for, let me pull that up here. Um, a shared um, deref. So you see the deref function is unsafe, right? Uh, it is. N it does not implement the deref trait, which is uh, commonly the case for for wrapper types like this. Uh, and the reason is because it could be pointing to invalid memory, right? A shared is really just a raw pointer. It's nothing else. Um, and okay, so we need to whenever we want to deref. Um, a shared, we're gonna to have to deal with this property, right? So this is the safety we need to guarantee when we wanna call deref. Dereferencing a pointer is unsafe because it could be pointing to invalid memory, right? So this is what we talked about with, with uh, garbage collection. Um, so we need to make sure that we haven't like, we haven't freed the memory that it's pointing to and the pointer isn't null. Another concern is the possibility of data races due to lack of proper synchronization. For example, considering the following scenario, uh, a.store owned new relaxed a load relaxed uh, unwrap um, the problem is that relaxed orderings don't synchronize initialization of the object with the read from the second thread um, so one one reason why this is less of a problem for us is that all of our orderings are currently sequentially consistent uh, but also the Java code is pretty careful about making sure that um, uh, a load is going to check the value that it gets back. It's not just going to like immediately download the uh, the value. What's the as ref here? Oh, that's to get through the owned. Okay, I think the primary safety uh, requirement is here, and in fact, for basically all of the places where we do this deref, the the argument is going to be the same. The argument is going to be because of our because our destruction logic. Um, guarantees that it's safe. All these derefs must be safe. Um, so let's just walk through these, let's see, I guess, bottom to top, uh, 83. Hmm? 83? Okay, so this is gonna be a deref, uh, and it's gonna be an unsafe. Safety. Uh, Next will only be dropped if we are dropped. We won't be dropped until epic passes. 
which is protected by guard. Thirty-eight. Ooh. Table is unsafe. Table deer off. this needs to be a shared I think this is just a straight up actually no we do want it to be tied to the guard I think um, no we can just do this Okay, so the argument here is safety. We are referenced to the old table, otherwise we would never reference to self. We got that under the given guard. Since we have not yet dropped that guard, no collection has happened. Uh, the self can't have been collected yet, and so neither as next table. Uh, so we've not yet dropped that guard. This table has not been garbage collected. And so the later table definitely hasn't. Um, safety, same as above. Great. Now what? Line 43. Bin. Okay, so here. Um, what do we want to do here? Here we want to say uh, bin dot deref. Let bin is unsafe, bin deref. Um, safety, uh, the table is protected by the guard, uh, and so is the bin. takes two arguments. Takes guard. That makes sense. Uh, 34. Uh, can't be null. Six seven two. For bin in mute self bins is not an iterator. It is now. Uh, six, seven, seven. Okay, let bin is unsafe. Bin deref. Uh, safety. Uh, we. Uh, what's the safety here? We own self or we have exclusive um, access to self um, so no one else will drop this value under us six seven three what uh, this is probably me being stupid. The guard needs to come last. 681. 
Expected shared found reference. Ah, I see. This it's just this. Six four six. Um all right, so here Um, this is going to be unsafe pdref safety um, actually the safety is just the same here that the, the same reason why we're allowed to destroy p down here is the reason why we're allowed to deref it up here it's the same safety argument. 642. No value, no field value on type P. Why is that? Um, really? That should give me a node, and node has a field value. Uh. Hmm. That's interesting, actually, that Um, what does the next pointer here? The next here is an atomic, which I think means that the head here, freeing the first node is actually a little bit different from freeing the subsequent ones. Because the first, the first node in the linked list is a bin entry, which contains a node. Right, so we have an atomic bin entry which contains a node. Um, the subsequent ones are just straight up atomic node. So they're a little bit different, uh, which means that the freeing has to be a bit different too, which is kind of awkward. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be a little awkward. Uh, I think what we want to do here is um, uh, does it mean that the first node and the subsequent not, do not have the same type? Yeah, the first node is a bin entry node. So it is um, a bin entry node which internally contains a node, right? And then that whole thing is wrapped in an atomic. Um, that's like the head type. But the next pointer is just an atomic node. There's no bin entry here, right? So they're actually different types. Um, uh, and normally this is fine, right? Because we're only ever calling methods on node. We're not calling that many methods on bin entry, except for find, which we're already using. The, the challenge is that when you want to free them, they actually have to be freed differently, um, which is kind of awkward. So I think what we're going to do here is, um, We're going to do head dot load next. Um, next dot load. That's what I meant. Uh, guard. Uh, and then down here, 
uh, now drop the head, which is going to be this business. Uh, that's going to be safety, same as for the tail above. So that should do, should do that. Uh, 660, this is me being stupid because guard has to come last, uh, which probably means that I messed this up somewhere above two. Yeah, up here, this has to have guard last. Probably means that this needs to have guard last. All right, how about that? All right, 625. Uh, shouldn't pin fix the issue for self-referential structs? Um, so I don't think this is really an issue with linked lists. This is specifically an issue with a like linked list in this particular context where you also have delayed dropping. Uh, it is true that the standard library pinning uh, will help with writing uh, linked lists, but not this type of linked list where you have a like a lock free linked list. Um, uh, can the tail end of your loop unwrap the atomic node to an owned node to match the first state? The problem is um, the when, when you call defer destroy, you have to pass it a type that was uh, there was originally a uh, allocated using as a using an owned, right? And we never for the head of the list for this first node, we never constructed an atomic node for the head. We construct an atomic bin entry node, and so we can't. Even though we can construct if we want to a shared node, it would, that would be incorrect because we that's not the thing that we're supposed to free. We're supposed to free a shared bin entry node for the first entry. For all the others, we're supposed to free a shared node. Uh, so that's why it actually has to be different. Um, uh, note that we must do this separately because for the head of the list, we're dropping a shared bin entry node. Node, not a uh, shared node. That makes sense? All right, so 625, four bin in table bins. Uh, right, I guess here uh, table is going to be unsafe, table deref. Uh, safety safe because same as above. Uh, 627. Oh, that's true. Should you come to think of it, where's the place where I do like this doesn't need to be that at all. Uh, it might be easier to manipulate using atomic into owned within the drop impl because an own pointer will drop for you when it got out of scope and you get safe defs. Um, that might be true, although it's like unclear it matters that much. Uh, Well, okay, sure. We can do um, bin is bin into owned. Is that what it's called for shared? Uh, yes, into owned. Right, so this is your proposal, right? Uh, what if a bin head gets removed from the map? The next bin entry should change type, type to replace the head. Um, that is a good question. Uh, 
I'm not sure. We might have to make the head an atomic. Like be an uh, be a atomic bin entry node where bin entry node is an atomic node. Which would be awkward, to say the least. Although it would mean that we could stick the lock right in that head. Maybe. Uh, let me think about that. You you might be totally right. That. Well, so currently we don't implement removal. I think. But yeah, I think once we once we implement remove, I think you're totally right that that would be the case. Uh, and we'll have to look at what we do with that. That might actually change the underlying impl. I agree. Um, okay, so here the argument is actually that uh, self table. I see. So here we can actually do a. Uh, shared null uh, and then we can do into owned and here we can do bin is bin is unsafe bin into owned. And here, let P, so here we can actually take ownership of the node um, is unsafe p into owned. I agree this this does make it nicer. Um, and now this can be uh, into owned. And then this can be node.next. Um, if you own the table, atomic into own skips the atomic load entirely. Oh, there's an atomic into owned as well. What does that do? Is that like if you have a mute self? Oh, that consumes self though, which uh, I can't easily do. Oh, I see. You mean if I have this, then I can do this. I see. Um, and then here we can do, so we can actually do even better now because we own this head. Um, here we can do a swap with shared null. Um, mm -hmm. That's owned. Then this value we can now do uh, a value into owned. 
uh, and the bin is now going to be dropped automatically. Uh, and I wonder whether we can do even better, which is because we own this value, this we can just do into owned. And similarly here, this we can just do into owned. Yep, that should do it. That's nice. And then maybe we don't even need the guard. Uh, in fact, we can do into owned here because we own the head. And then we just do node next into owned here. Right. Um, we still need the guard for the top level, though, I think. Because we don't technically own the table, because we only get mute self. But this does make it a lot nicer, I agree. Um, here. Yeah, this is going to stay the same. Nice. I agree. That's much, much nicer. Uh, 680. Uh, what is this complaining about? Oh, right. Uh, star that. Actually gives us an owned back, not a uh, method not found for owned node. Yeah, this is just P now. Six, three, four. Ah, if P dot next dot is null. Actually, that's awkward. Uh, Panics of the pointer is null, yeah. It's, but is there a way for me to check whether it's null without loading it? Nope. That's not great. That's really awkward. Uh, <laughs> That's really awkward. Um, yeah, I think we actually do need to do like a load here, which is super awkward. Uh, I mean, it's fine. It's just sad. Um, And table bins. This is awkward too. Uh, balls. We can't actually destruct this one. Uh, well, actually, no, we can. We can do uh, vec from boxed slice. Isn't there a, a 
box slice. All right, 632, what's here now? I'm gonna star that, that's fine. 602. Uh, Okay, so now, okay, here we really need to do a defer destroy, that's fine. And this is gonna be an unsafe uh, p defer. And the reason that defer is safe is the same reason why it's safe to defer destroy. So that's all good. Um, No method named defer. That's because it should be deref. <laughs> wow, so many derefs. Uh, 584. Okay, so here, next table and table. Um, so I think what we want to do here is to say none of this changes table or next table, right? No, great. Um, so up here, uh, okay, so here we need to make an argument along the lines of uh, table deref, why that is safe. And next table, deref, why are these safe? Uh, why are these safe? It's a great question. Um, I don't think that they necessarily are. Um, I think that only if this is the case, are they safe? Right, so in this case, those shareds were both constructed. Um, um, what do I want to guarantee here? So for transfer, we want to guarantee that both table and next table remain valid, uh, specifically that they're not destroyed. Uh, they will be dropped when the guard is dropped. Mm. Right. Um, we're, we're guaranteeing that with the signature because if the guard was dropped, if the guard was dropped, then these would no longer be valid. So by having this constraint, we're saying that you, um, that these shareds are tied to the lifetime of this guard. Great, so that's what we want. Um, as long as that is the case, um, these will be dropped at the earliest, uh, or these were read while the guard was held, while guard was held. We still hold guard. Uh, and um, the code that drops these won't drop these uh, ensures that they are only dropped
actually. Uh, we got to be careful here. Um, these were read while guard was held. We still hold guard. Um, so, our guard was held. The code that drops these only drops them uh, after A, they are no longer reachable, and B, um, only drops them after they are lo no longer reachable, and B, any outstanding references are no longer active. We are still active. Uh, these references are still active. marked by the guard um, so they won't be dropped so the target of these references won't be dropped while the guard remains active uh, so safe with all that unsafe well so so keep in mind that for each unsafe block here we're thinking very carefully about why that unsafety is okay and it is true that like unsafe code is less safe than safe code. Um, but the reason for that is because in unsafe code, you are, you as the programmer are telling the compiler, I have checked that I maintain the necessary invariants and the compiler cannot check those invariants for you. That's sort of, if they could, then you shouldn't be writing unsafe code in the first place. And so this is really us being really careful about thinking through why, how are we sure that we're upholding the things that the, the, the sort of restrictions of the unsafe code. Um, okay, now we're at 591. Um, wait, but that's why no method as raw found on table. Oh, that's just this. That's fine. Um, five ninety one. Expected U size found I size. Where does I come from? Oh, I see. Well, at this point, uh, I can be u size because if it was negative, uh, we would enter this. 591. Expected owned, found shared. Um, so that is store bin. And I think this can take anything that's a P where P is cross beam epic pointer. Right? Store is pointer to one of these guys. Uh, now imagine this was C and you would have to go through all the code to check those invariants. Yeah, exactly. So the idea here is that at least we only have to check the unsafe parts. That's the idea. Um, and it's true, this, this, this code we're writing is like highly concurrent and unsafe code, but that's sort of what we chose to write. Uh, and the, the idea here is that once we get this code to be right, anyone who uses this code will not have to think about that unsafety, right? That's the idea. We're sort of encapsulating the unsafety in our code. Um, yeah, this is where things get tricky. Maybe we're gonna run into this business already now.
Yeah, so the challenge here now is Oh man. I just realized something else too. Um No, that's fine. Um, one thing we're going to run into here is, I think this is the, the point that came up earlier. Here we're going to store a bin, but what we're storing is node, not bin entry. But the head needs to be a bin entry. Yeah, it's kind of awkward. So there are a couple of options here. One is we do this like double indirection at the head. Um, the other is that we merge the, we just stick node directly into bin entry remove the node type and just have the bin entry type and maybe rename it. Um, problem there is that every node is now slightly larger, but it might not really matter that much. Um, yeah, it's a little awkward, but that might be what we have to do. Uh, I wonder why are these constructs even needed? It feels like all of that validation can be done on a C++ compiler front end. Can you show any example when it's absolutely impossible to do that? I think you need to provide an example. I don't know what constructs you're talking about or what validation you believe can be done in a C++ compiler front end. And if so, which C++ compiler front end? Saying that something is theoretically possible doesn't really help, right? Um, you would need to Show me one that can do this, uh, whatever this is. Um, oh yeah, I think we're gonna make the, I think we're just gonna have to merge this into one type. It's gonna be necessary for the removal business later anyway. That's too bad. Uh, defer the wrapping of the node until it becomes another node's next pointer. Uh, the, the problem with doing that is we're trying to do this all this atomically. So if someone wants to add another node, they're going to basically do an atomic like compare and swap. And so you can't easily do that. Um, yeah, it's going to be awkward. The types aren't quite going to work out either. Merging node into bin entry will also make it tricky to follow a chain of nodes down. Uh, right now we have the good logic that node points to forwarding node doesn't ever happen. Yeah, it it means that we could no longer quite encode that, um, which is certainly annoying. Um, yeah, it's not it's not great. It's not great. Hmm. The the problem we'd run into is we'd we'd end up with a bunch of like runtime assertions of like this pattern can't happen. So for example, we know that if you have a node, all the subsequent nodes are going to be of the node type. You can't have a node that's followed by a forwarding node. Um which is currently encoded in the type system. But if we changed bin entry, if we, if we merged node into bin entry, then now there's nothing in the types that guarantee that that is the case. Um, and so 
it would still be fine. Like the code would be fine, but it would mean that um, there are more places where we would have to match on the node type and then sort of say that it's impossible to be in the case where this is a moved. Um, Um, can you explain the exact problem with the current types? Yeah, okay, let me let me try this again. Um, okay, so here's, the, actually, let me draw this. That might be easier. All right, so um, here's the challenge. Let me make this a little bit smaller, maybe there. Um, Okay, so we have our table. Um, and let's consider any given entry. Each entry is just a pointer, right? And this pointer has some type T. Um, and what we're gonna construct is uh, either a linked list or one of these forwarding nodes, right? That this head pointer is gonna be either a pointer to like one of these or a pointer to one of these. Uh, but if you are in this case, if you have a linked list, then this pointer we know is a pointer to a node. It is it cannot be that one of these pointers is a pointer to one of these types. That can never happen, right? So the question becomes, what are these types? Well, if T uh, is uh, something like an enum of node or forward, right? It's an enum of one of these. So the question becomes, what do we go, what goes here, right? There's gonna be some type U, right? Where this is U, this is U, and this is U. Um, so the question becomes in the definition of U, which is gonna be a struct, uh, what is the next type? Well, it's gonna be an atomic. Uh, and the question becomes, what goes here? Well, Either we stick U here, that's what we currently have, right? And that now in the type system, there is no way, when you, if you have a U, you know that the next thing is a U. All is good. But it means that the head pointer, right? Th this pointer right here, that pointer is of type atomic T, right? Because that head pointer, it can be either or. So the head is of atomic T, but the next is of atomic U. And this means that the, the sort of, how to phrase this. Um, this means that the allocation that happens at the head is an allocation of a T, and the allocation that happens of next is allocations of U. And that means that they're just different things. It also means that, for example, and this was the observation that was made earlier, if the head of a list gets uh, removed and some later things becomes the head, its type is going to have to change from U to T. And it's going to have to do so atomically because remember, all of this is like lock-free atomic stuff. Um, and converting something from a U to a T is not necessarily trivial. I mean, it, it is, it's just a wrapping, but th that wrapping is like a heap allocation and an atomic pointer swap. Uh, that is tricky. Um, so the alternative, and this is what was proposed, uh, let me dig up like some other color here. Um, one alternative to this is to say, well, uh, this type is just gonna be T instead. Okay, well now these two types are equal, right? So that's good. The problem now is if I have a U and I do uh, U dot next, the type of U dot next is a T. I know, right, as the programmer, I know that this is always a U. It's always a, a node, right? I know that, but that's not, not encoded in the type system. So everywhere where I do U.next, I'm gonna have to match on U.next, 
if it's a node, then do the right thing. If it's a forward, then like panic, this is unreachable. But that's not very satisfying, right? Um, uh, forward has to be heap allocated because it needs to be an atomic pointer swap. Uh, would you come to play using dynamic dispatch? Uh, dynamic dispatch would not help here because for dynamic dispatch, you need a wide pointer. Um, and a wide pointer, you can't easily do an atomic pointer swap on. Um, one more layer of indirection, node atomic U in T. Yeah, so the, the third option, um, if I can get this to do the right thing, the third option here is, uh, let's do that color, I guess. Third option here is for this to contain an atomic uh, U. And for next to also be an atomic U. Because now uh, the type of allocation at this point and the type of allocation at this point are both U's. So converting between them is simple. The downside is that we now have a double indirection for every lookup, right? Because an atomic is a heap allocation. And so this is also costly. Uh, why not a trait object for inside the atomic? Yeah, atomics can't be trait objects, I believe, because you need a, it's a fat pointer because you need the V table pointer as well. Um, uh, you could box the trade object, but the moment you box it, it is no longer atomic. You can't do atomic swaps on it. Um, unless you have like support for uh, like wide atomics, which um, I don't think we want to assume. Um, so these are the, th the three options. The, the only one that doesn't come with... Uh, the only one I think that doesn't come with overhead, sadly, is the one where we just merge everything into the top level enum. Um, and then like the, the red solution, basically. Um, and it, it is definitely a little sad because we're going to have a bunch of unreachables, but I think it's what we're going to be stuck with at the moment. Um, uh, all right, let me go pee and think about this <laughs> and you can think about it too and pee if you need to
Um, are the current types only inconvenient to use? No, we don't actually have a way to... Um, uh, sorry, this is where the, the issue came up, um, which is what I was getting to explaining, but didn't quite, uh, which was uh, here. Um, the tricky part is when you do a resize and you have an existing linked list, um, and now you're going to split that linked list and you're going to place it in two different bins in the new table. Imagine that you're moving a run, right? The run, the head of the run is going to be just a node. It's not going to be a bin entry. It's not going to be an enum. It's just going to be the struct, but it's going to become the head of the new thing. So now we would have to, uh, we would have to reallocate it for that to work. The head of the run that is. Now, arguably in this particular instance, we know that we own the target bin. Uh, so we could just redo the wrapping, but this is still gonna come back to bite us when we do remove. Um, uh, uh, red comes with some memory over it. Um, there's a little bit of memory overhead just because the tag of the enum. Uh, I'm more concerned with the, the effect it has on cache performance, but it should be small. Um, okay. Well, uh, the only thing we really need to change is that this is going to become a bin entry, this. Um, which means that this is going to become a bin entry, this. Um, which means this is going to become a bin entry, this. Um, which also is awkward because uh, yeah, it's not great. It's not great. Um, Oh, you're right. It's going to be bin entry KB. Yeah, it makes me real sad. It makes me real sad. The other annoying thing is that we can't have find on node anymore because it might have to return self. Um, well. Yeah. I think this is just, we're going to have to, uh, if n dot hash is hash and n dot key is key, then uh, self. Oh, that's awful. Oh, it's going to have to go through the whole. Uh, fine, 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 fine. No, okay, this, this might be okay. This might be okay. 
Uh, it's just going to mean that this code is going to go up here. And this is going to be if this then returns self uh, shared from self um, Yeah, so this is currently recursive, which might not be what we want, but. In fact, I think it's very specifically not what we want. Um, this is gonna be break. This is gonna be break. Um, This is one example of like here, we would have to do this match to see whether it's moved each time and just like not necessary. We know it's not a forwarding node. Um, so in the, in the Java implementation, it, it uses, um, uh, it uses like virtual function overload. Um, no, I think self-referential structs wouldn't really help here. Uh, So here, instead, what we're going to do is um, node is n. Oh, geez, that's terrible. Um, So ugly, it's so ugly. Um, yep, then it's gonna break with that. Otherwise, it's gonna do node equals next DRF. I think that's what's going to end up being. And this whole find can go away. And at that point, there's no need for the node type anymore. That can just go straight into here. Um, although that would make this not work. So we're going to keep it the way it was actually. All right, let's see what that gives us. Um, that's going to break to self dot find. No, bin dot find. Great. Um, all right. Six, five, five. Um, no 
no field next on owned bin entry. Yeah, so now we get into this pain, which is um, now this walk is awkward. We own the bin, we get the head. Uh, <laughs> right, and now this is going to be um, we're constantly going to have to destructure this. Because uh, uh, this is going to be node is if let bin entry node head um, at least now these can be we don't need to drop the head separately so now this can just be this p is head um, This is now unreachable. See, this is the, the like ugly business I mean, right? Um, this is gonna drop the node's value. This is gonna get the node. Um, and this is gonna do the node. Six, six, one. Um, expected node bin entry. Found owned. This should say bin. Uh, what's my typo? What's preventing all the formatting? 652, right. Um. No field next on bin entry. Yeah, so this is going to be the same thing where um, <laughs> next is going to be. node is going to be if let bin entry node head uh, no n is equal to unsafe p deref then uh, I guess next then n dot Next dot load, and we have to do this whole business. Guard else unreachable, um, and then P is next. Five ninety one. Um, why is N here a an I size? Where does n come from? But n is a u size. Where is what am I missing? What am I missing? N is definitely a U size. Yeah, let's do that later. 
591. Same thing. Expected use as find out size. But it's complaining about this line. But I comes from I is definitely a, a U size. And N, like I equals N right here. Uh, let n, well, let's double check so that is indeed u size, but I don't see why it wouldn't be. Well, okay. Um, make as node an infallible method on bin entry. The panics if it's a move node. We could do that. Uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, Another is to implement DREF. Just have bin entry DREF into node. Um, I'm going to leave that for later. All right, we're back to where we originally were, which was to insert these unsafe P DREF business calls. Uh, so safety here is uh, probably the same as in all the other cases. Uh, in this particular case, though, it is... Where's our safety argument nearby here? Um, uh, all right, so here, oh yeah, this is kind of subtle. Uh, so here we need to somehow guarantee that the given P that we are accessing, actually let's do this a little bit nicer in that we do up here, uh, let node is unsafe pdref, because that way these can all just be easier to deal with. Um, so what's the safety here? Um, P is a valid pointer. Uh, and the reason why P is a valid pointer is because P would be dropped. Uh, P would only be dropped where P is only dropped uh, in the next epoch following when it was swapped to null. Uh, see safety comment near, um, where's the place where that happens? That's down here. Uh, following when it's bin c safety comment near table dot store bin below. When it's bin next following when it's been is swapped to uh, replaced with a move node. Uh, um, we read the bin and got to P, so it is not a move node. Um, so its bin has not yet been swapped with a move node. Um, therefore, it will be dropped in a future epoch. Move node. Uh, and we have the epoch pinned, so the next uh, epoch cannot have arrived yet. Therefore, it will be dropped in a future epoch and is safe to use now.
All right. 580. Oh. <laughs> if let bin entry uh, node and node is that then node else unreachable. All right, 555. Five, five. It's probably the same argument up here. Um, node, node, actually at this point we could, do they need to be shared still? I don't think they actually need to be shared. Oh, last run does. Oh, we could just construct shared from them, probably. Okay, right, fine. We'll leave it this way. Uh, so we can do here to save us a little bit of extra typing. Um, if no dot next is null. Why is this while loop? checking next first. Why is it not if node is null? All right, fine. Stick to what it was. Uh, 565, 64. What? Oh, I see. We need to do a uh, next is node, next load. If next is null, break. Uh, P is next. Five forty six. Um, this probably doesn't have to happen here. This can happen here. Five twenty three match bin. Uh, all right, so here we're gonna do a unsafe bins. This is the same story. Uh, the safety here is, um, it's very similar to the safety why P is a valid pointer down here, right? Uh, bin is a valid pointer. Bin, so when is bin is dropped? Uh, bin, why does this is only be dropped? That's not what I meant to say. Um, same thing here. Uh, bin is only dropped when the head of the bin is replaced with a move node. We read the bin and we got. Uh, we read the bin. Actually, the bin is only dropped uh, when the table uh, is dropped, right? That's when we drop all the all the heads. Um, actually, there are two. There are two cases. There are two cases when. Uh, bin pointer is invalidated. One, uh, if the t 
table was resized, bin is a move uh, is a move entry, um, and the resize has completed. In this case, um, right? So if the table is resized, uh, and bin is a move entry and the resize is completed, then the old table is dropped and that includes all of the bin heads, which are just forwarders. Uh, in that case, the table will be destroyed in the next, the table and all its heads will be dropped uh, in the next epoch following that. Two, uh, if the table is being resized, um, bin may be swapped with a move entry. Um, if the table is being resized, bin may be swapped with a move entry. Uh, the old bin will then be destroyed, will be dropped in the following epoch after that happens. Um, in both cases, we held the guard when we read the, uh, when we got the reference to the bin. Uh, so the next um, uh, if the swap happened, if if any such swap happened, it must have happened after we read uh, since we did the read while pinning the epic, uh, the drop must happen in the next epoch, i.e. the one that we are holding up by holding on to our guard. Whew. Uh, can this unreachable matching business be encapsulated? It can. We, we can do this like if, if we feel strongly about this, um, then the way to do it is actually pretty straightforward. It's just going to be a uh, node um, or deref, to be honest. But um, as node, I guess, um, it's going to be self to node kv. Um, and in fact, if we wanted to be real, real fancy, we do this. If let uh, bin entry node of n is self, then sum n, else none, uh, unreachable. Does that make you happier? Um, it, it does look nicer, I agree. Uh, it's going to be ass node. Mm, this is going to be the same. Um, this is going to be uh, next. Um, here, we actually want to keep the current one because we want to get the node as owned. Um, this we want to keep. Here, we can do node as node unwrap key. Uh, 
that we want to keep. This we want to keep. Six eleven. Uh, mismatch type. This needs to be a bin entry node. Five eleven. This needs to be ooh, method not found. It's because next table should just be this. Five oh five. Function takes two, it takes a guard. An easy fix. 491. Yeah, see, well, I don't understand where this end is coming from. What am I missing? N is a U size. What's it on about? Expected I size found U size. U size stamp. All right. Number of leading hits. Definitely an I size. All right, fine. So if that's an I size, then I also has to be an I size. And so we're just gonna keep it an I size. We're gonna cast it to a U size down here. Actually, Where's the place where we combine it with a six two four as I size? No field. All right, so I think next table. Does any of this code do anything with next table? No. Just that. Um, next n bins len. Um, next table is read while the guard was held. The code the drops next table uh, only drops it after. Um, it is no longer reachable and any outstanding references are no longer active. This reference is still active right by the guard. So the target of the reference, yep. Uh, four, four, five. Expected I size found U size. This is going to have to be as I size. Uh, 386. Um, this is going to be the same argument as for next table below. So what I'm going to do here Uh, should say table. Uh, same argument as for table above. Three ninety eight. What do we got here? Um, We need that to be a use size. And then we're going to do let n is 
n as i size. How can n be negative? I don't think n can be negative. Oh, it's for the like resize stamp business. I think a resize, the n is always, uh, show me this resize, resize stamp. Okay, of size n. So n is definitely a u size. Okay. Which means that my dear n up here can go back to being in u size. This can stay a u size. Great. 631. Now. These can just be i plus n, the way it was meant to be, 498. Uh, why is i here? Right, because i is an i size until here, because it can be negative. 41. Okay. Uh, if we get to this or, then I must be positive. So this can be this. Transfer index. Why can transfer index be negative? Like, why is transfer index an I size? I don't believe that for a second. Unless they use like negative to indicate that um, next bound. Yeah, unless next bound can somehow be negative, but all right, fine. Well, I'll store it as an I size. Still find it very hard to believe that it has to be signed. Um, five, seven, three. Uh, consider giving head a type um, well it is a bin entry not a bin entry I'm in fact entirely lying. This has to be a head is just going to be bin now. Yeah, this is just going to be it's going to be bin. This is going to be bin. This is going to be bin. This is going to be bin. Yeah, let's make sure we didn't overwrite bin anywhere in between. I don't think we did. It's not mutable, hopefully. Great. Uh, 620. No clone found for raw mutex. Really? Why does it matter? So this is, we're moving. 
This lock is only taken if you want to overwrite the value. I'm decently sure this can just create a new lock. Um, but if we're unsure, um, let's run. Then what does this code do? It does it. Oh, I see. Uh, this can definitely be a new lock because in, in j the Java world, it's using the like per object lock. So there's just a new lock every time. So that's fine. Um, why does the key need to be cloned? The key does need to be cloned because the old key might still stick around in the map. Um, that's real awkward. So the, the observation here is that um, Uh, the old bin is going to still have a bunch of the, the old bins linked list is still going to have a bunch of nodes and, and there might be threads that are accessing those nodes and you need to look at the keys, but we need to allocate a new node and that new node also needs to hold the key. And so here we're going to clone the key. Well, one alternative would be to not clone the key, but instead like put the key behind like an arc somewhere. Um, I don't really want to do that if I can avoid it. So instead, uh, we're just going to require that the key is clone, which definitely makes me a little sad. Um, but such is life for now. Uh, Uh, muscle team. Yes, I am using COC, but I'm, I don't actually want stuff in my terminal because very often, especially when doing development like this, like I know that there are a bunch of errors and if the errors just came as I typed, it would first of all, take a lot of CPU cycles. And also many of the errors I know about, uh, I don't want to see the errors until I'm ready to see the errors. I could have a shortcut for running uh, COC or running RLS. Um, but it's annoying to set up and it's easier to browse through them this way too. Cause now I have them in a terminal rather than have them show up in like the Vim quick fix. Uh, so that's why, um, okay. So here, what's the argument? The argument here is probably the same as what we've given above actually. Um, Um, so the safety here is, do we have another safety further up? No. Um, table is only dropped. Uh, on the next epic change after it is swapped to uh, no, uh, we read it as not null. Um, so it must not be dropped until a subsequent epoch. Since we hold a guard, um, we know that no new epoch is happening. Uh, uh, we know that the current epoch will persist uh, and that our reference will therefore remain valid. You see, this is really just many ways of stating the same security property, all of which are relating back to when we choose to drop things. Um, So 
So this is going to be same thing, deref this. Um, ooh, what did I break? What? 286. I'm confused. Four eighty nine. Oh, great. Two eighty six. Um, I think also for this. We probably need to require that these are this. Um, look up next. We read it as not null since we held guard at the time. Continues to persist, and that our reference is therefore valid. Two five nine. Uh, this is another node, isn't it? Yep, it is indeed. Um. This is sadly going to be bin. Um, and here, I guess we're going to do n is no. It's going to be p, because that's what we've been using. Uh, p deref dot as node unwrap. It's the same pattern. Uh, and the safety condition here is probably just going to be exactly the same. Um, specifically, we read the bin while pinning the epic. The bin was... Um, A bin will never be uh, dropped until the next epoch after uh, it is uh, removed. Since it wasn't removed and the epoch was pinned, that can be cannot be until uh, after we drop our guard. All right, we're getting closer. Uh, table. So here we can do another like um, table dot deref safety. Let me see that that actually fixes a bunch of these. Yeah, it should. Um, so what's the safety here? The safety here is. Oh, uh, there are a couple of them actually. Um, table is a valid pointer. Uh, if table is the one we read before the loop, uh, then we read it while holding the guard. 
So it won't be dropped until we drop that guard. Because the uh, drop logic um, only queues a drop for the next epic after removing the table. Um, if table is read by init table, and what's the last case? If uh, table is set by move below. Are there any other things to change table? No. Um, all right, so what does in it, because these both override table, right? So we need to make sure that no matter which, which shared we ended up with, which shared table, it is okay to do this deref. Um, so if table is read by in it table, then The only way we break from this is either here, in which case we do a load after the guard is pinned, or here, in which case we did a store, so it must be valid. And no one else, if someone else were to drop it, uh, they would have to wait for an epic. Uh, if table is read by init table, then either we did a load uh, and the argument is as for point one. We are in one of three cases. Um, either we load in the arms or um, we allocated a table, in which case the earliest it can be deallocated is in the next epoch. We are holding up the epoch by holding the guard. Uh, so this deref is safe. Um, and if table is set by a moved node, Okay, so this is a tricky one, right? So this is, we're just going to do, we're going to do this help transfer through help transfer. Then what? Uh, Well, in all these cases, it's going to return next table. Except for there, where it's going to return table. Um, it will either return table. Uh, which is fine by one and two. It will either uh, keep using table, which is fine by one or two, or use next table from uh, as, uh, or use the next table pointer from inside the moved. Uh, in the latter case, uh, okay, so the question becomes, okay, here's the question. We have a moved entry and the moved entry is a raw pointer. Here, in order for this deref to be safe, we need to guarantee that that raw pointer is still valid. How do we know that's the case? Well, um, raw pointer from inside the moved. How do we know 
that that is safe. Well, uh, we got to the move node uh, transitively through a, re a load of table. That load of table happened uh, in the current epic, since the epic is pinned, is still pinned. Um, uh, all right, so when is a table destroyed? A table is destroyed when a table is destroyed in the next epoch after the resize finished. Um, load of table. Since that, um, right, how do we phrase this? A table is only ever dropped in is only dropped in the epoch following a resized actually a table is only dropped in the epoch following Well it's weird because the moved points to the table after the resize following when its resize has completed. Uh, in the case of moved T, uh, T can only have been dropped if uh, if T uh, was resized and that resize has completed and an epoch has passed. Um, uh, for T, to be resized. Oh, this is a finicky argument. Uh, so um, the question is, does the user code of this hash map need to concern itself with not holding guards for too long to avoid growing memory? Else the epic never increases. Um, yes and no. Uh, we haven't implemented iterators yet, and iterators is one place where this is going to be tricky. Uh, but if you look at the signature or the, the contents of get and insert, those internally construct a guard. So the user never gives a guard in. And what this means is that the, the user just can't hold on to the guard for too long because the guard is only held for the duration of the getter insert. Um, either keep using table, which is fine by one or two, or use the next table raw pointer from inside the moved. How do we know that that is safe? A table is only dropped in the epic following when it's uh, a table is only dropped um, if it is resized. Uh, that This paragraph gets too complicated. A table is only dropped if it is resized. Uh, for t, for table t in moved t to be dropped, um, I feel like there's a simpler argument here. For table T and move T to be dropped. Um, The, the property we want to make sure holds 
is that if you drop a moved T, uh, actually, the property we want to make sure we hold, uphold is that if a moved T exists, then the T is still valid which I think we uphold by virtue of the destroy, but I don't think, uh, I can't quite figure out how to articulate it. Um, we must demonstrate that if a move T is red, then T must still be valid. Fix me. Uh, let's leave that for a little bit later. I believe it's true. It's just we need to expected reference found here. This is this is just going to be p instead of n. 285 node KV. The value type for node is wrong. Atomic new I think maybe this should just be that. Great. Two fifty four. Hmm. Into owned. Ah, that was not at all what I meant to do. And this is fine because we haven't given out. So let's see, safety. Uh, we own value. Uh, and have never shared it. Two forty nine. This has to be a reference. Uh, oh, yeah, keys obviously need to be comparable. Two two nine. Uh, no field lock. Two fourteen. Almost there. Expect a reference found shared. Uh, oh yeah, this should probably just be T. Because we need to still be able to refer to the old T. Those are the only ones. Great. Uh, Two twelve. Match bin. Um. Oh, this is a simple one. This is just um, uh, safety. Uh,
I think this is just the same argument as this one. Yep, well, that's just the same argument. Uh, 168. This is going to be table deref. Safety C argument below for not is null case. Uh, where were we saying? 129 in a table. Uh, this is going to take. G and give you back a shared over G. Um, DRF safety. We loaded the table while epic was pinned. Table won't be deallocated until next epoch at the earliest. Um, that's the same argument as here. Ah, oh, so few errors left. I mean, we haven't gotten to the bar checker stage yet, I think, so it's probably still some challenges, but um, R. Um, this is going to be unsafe deref. Um, I think what we probably want here actually is a uh, implement a uh, guard API of our own. Um, so why is this okay? Safety. Um, we are still holding the guard. So the uh, end of and saw value. And saw v, uh, so it won't be uh, dropped until the next epoch after we drop our guard at the earliest. Ninety-three uh, table is unsafe. Deref. Same argument again. One oh two. Um, safety. So this is the same as the argument for our other uh, bin deref. Sort of want to collect all of these in one place rather than have them spread out like this. Um, but okay. Um, let node is node as node unwrap 116 this probably takes a guard 
and 120. Uh, node is unsafe, node as ref. No, as, I mean deref. Um, and here the, the safety is the same argument as before, um, where uh, no deref, huh? pdref? Um, nice, how many? Six, oh man, that's not many at all. Um, can I move out of dereference? What? Where? 778. Uh, this is into box. So that's fine. 68. What? 68 value does not need to be mutable. 765. Um, can I move out of dereference? Owned. Into box, I guess. Oh, that's awkward. So here we can't actually walk these bins and have them be owned um, because we can't take ownership out of table because table implements drop. And if we iterate over the, the array, the, the box slice, uh, then we don't get very far either. Uh, what we can do here, though, is uh, replace uh, box, I guess, it's vec uh, into box slice. And then vec from. It ain't pretty, but it works. Seven six five uh, should be uh, mute indeed. All right, six six seven. Uh, run bit has to be mutable. That is totally true. 461 count has to be mutable. That is also true. 420 table does not have to be mutable. 237 node is borrowed. Oh, that's going to be real awkward actually to fix because we borrowed the key here to make life easier for ourselves but that might have been a mistake uh, so you know we can just do it here instead what am I missing from that there's no use of key further up so we can just do it here <gasps> it compiles it compiles. It is alive. It's alive. Uh, saw bin length. That's fine. We don't actually know what to do with that yet. Load factor is not used. Ooh. Um, implement all. Um, perhaps 
uh, how to phrase this? Um, how do we phrase this? Um, I think what we write here is, it doesn't really matter for these kind of commit messages, but perhaps something along the lines of add in all safety uh, uh, figure out most of the safety uh, invariants Uh, do you plan on implementing tests? Yes, indeed. So actually, uh, your screen is going to go bright in a second, just so you're all aware. Um, the Java testing, uh, the Java concurrent hash map has a bunch of tests. So the plan is to implement those as well, uh, but we won't do that today. My guess is there'll be one more stream on concurrent hash map. Now that we have like the basics working, we now need to actually test it and get it to work, and, and, um, and that's going to be the next stream. All right, so we now have a thing that compiles. Uh, we don't actually have anything that can do anything useful. Um, and, all right, let's just, just for the heck of it, uh, it works. Flurry hash map. Do we have like a new? Probably don't even have a new, do we? That's awkward. Okay, we don't even have an implementation of new. Uh, so this is gonna be the fix me for next time. Uh, do I not sign my git commits? Uh, I used to. Um, these times, not so much anymore. Um, it's not clear to me that it carries that much value, uh, if, especially if you turn on auto sign. Uh, I might turn it back on. It, I had some problems with GPG for a while, um, but those should be resolved now. Okay, uh, I think we're gonna call it there because now we have something that actually compiles. Um, uh, the biggest things that are left now is actually running the thing. Uh, removal is gonna be a big, uh, big thing. There's sort of the the tree balance, the balanced tree stuff that they do, which I think we're probably not going to port. Uh, and the the um, sharded counter business they do. Um, there was one more. Oh yeah, and then and then of course figuring out that last uh, safety invariant that we ended up leaving as a fix me. We need to document uh, and convince ourselves that that is actually um, that that code is actually correct. Um, with that though. I think we're in a pretty good position. Um, my guess is there will be one more stream on uh, the concurrent hash map where hopefully we'll be in a position where it all works. Um, so that's gonna be whatever, whenever the next stream is. Um, I'm leaving for holiday on Monday and we'll be back mid-January. So my guess is that the next stream is gonna be end of January sometime. Um, I hope this was possible to follow. This is like very hairy code, but hopefully the us talking through it helped a lot. Um, and I've pushed all the code. So if you want to like read through it at your own pace and compare it to the Java code, just, just have a look in the GitHub repo. Um, and with that, I wish you all a happy new year and I will see you in 2020. Bye everyone. It's great to have you here as always. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. All right, bye.